As we settle down in our seats, we're gonna focus, we're gonna focus on our breath. So slowly close your eyes. If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, close your eyes. If you feel, um, if you wanna keep your eyes open, keep them open. But try to fix your gaze and your eyesight on a fixed point in this room. And as you settle down in the chair where you are, we're gonna call in our ancestors to be present. We're gonna call in the divine light of the universe to be present. All the beautiful energies in the spirit world, our loved ones on the other side, the angels, and all the pure and divine white light in this universe. As you find yourself in your seat, just focus on the sensations of your body, where you're sitting down, your feet firmly on the ground. Try to have your spine kind of straight, your back straight, and start to relax yourself where you are. Taking a deep breath in, slowly breathing out, taking the time this morning just to sit comfortably and start breathing in and out. Fill your chest with air, slowly breathe out, just breathing in and out. It's always good to remember to breathe. In the middle of our lives and our stresses, we forget to breathe this breath of life this breath of light, breathing in and out, listening to your body at this moment, focusing on any sensations that you're feeling, bringing your thoughts back to your body whenever your mind wanders around. Bring it back to the space, bring it back to the breath, breathing in and out as comfortably as you can easing your breath in and easing your breath out, relaxing your shoulders, relaxing your back, your neck, focusing on your face, relax the muscles on your cheeks and around your eyes. Notice sensations in your feet, your legs, listening to your body as you breathe in and out filling your chest with beautiful light and energy. Breathing in and out. Just envision that your feet, as it's firmly on the ground, is growing beautiful roots that are digging deeper and deeper into the ground. You have powerful and strong roots that are growing deeper and deeper, digging in the ground, reaching the heart of Mother Earth herself. Mother Earth is grounding your energy, giving you strength and power to be in the present moment. Now, as your roots are strongly, firmly in the ground, I want you to envision a bubble of pure white light coming towards you as you're breathing in and out. This pure white light is gonna fully surround your body right now. The white light feels warm, comfortable, peaceful, and protective. This is the white light of the angels, your ancestors right here in this moment, your loved ones. This is the divine universe, God's energy. In the white light, your body feels comfortable and peaceful. It brings more love and harmony into yourself. Release any negativity, any stress to the white light as the angels bring peace, love, and harmony into our gathering. The white light is one with you and you're one with the white light. 
Your feet are firmly on the ground. You're feeling more grounded, loved, and appreciated. With gratitude, we breathe in and out. And we're bringing our whole self into this morning. We bring our full presence, our full consciousness, and above all, we're bringing our hearts, our love into this community, into this space, into this moment. And in your mind's eye, just repeat the words to yourself, I am present. I am present. I am present. We're thankful for this moment, thankful for the breath, for the energies, for the loving hearts that bring us together in this full moment of love, appreciation, and gratitude. And now, as we take our breath in and out, we're gonna slowly open our eyes, bringing our consciousness back to this space. You can wiggle your toes. As you feel comfortable, your fingers are moving, taking this deep breath in and out. You have brought yourself here in this moment. As we come back to our full consciousness of this room, we're gonna take a few seconds just to take this energy and this meditation into our hearts and we're gonna be ready for the drumming ceremony that's gonna start. Just feel the blessing, remember to breathe, and let's take this deep silence in this second.
I'm so excited to be here. My name is Lauren Melendez. I'm going to be guiding you through parts of this symposium. We have a fantastic uh, day, afternoon, morning plan for you. If that wasn't any indication, let's just give another round of applause to that beautiful, beautiful performance. Yes. OK. All right, again, I'm so excited to officially welcome you all today to such a fantastic symposium. This is the Prospera Institute's inaugural Health Equity for All Symposium. My name is Lauren Melendez. We guys, we're under one roof, okay? We're bringing together thought experts, thought leaders, artists, community members, and of course, public health practitioners to explore specifically what it means to have equal access in terms of achieving health prosperity. You're gonna hear this phrase uh, said over and over again, health equity, racial equity, social justice, bioethics. So these are going to be key terms that I really want you to focus on and, and just sort of think about what it means to you. So we're going to have some insightful discussions. We're going to talk. We're going to feel. We're going to explore. We might cry. We're going to hug. Whatever it takes, again, to really make this a successful day uh, and just make our community stronger in terms of health equity. So with that being said, I'm not going to bore you. I do have some corny jokes sprinkled in, but we're going to just skip over that for now. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. I am a journalist with NBC10 Boston. I'm a reporter anchor. I've been here for about a year now. I moved here in October. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> for me? <laughs> Um, I, I love this city. I'm from Philadelphia, but man, I got to tell you, when I moved to Boston, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I lived in the Midwest for several years, and unlike most people, I really did miss uh, traffic and people flipping me off and, and on the streets, and you know, I felt like I'm at home. So, um, I am no bioethicist by any means. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I am Afro-Latina, so I will say that I'm half black and half Puerto Rican. I, thank you, yeah, I identify as heterosexual. I'm telling you all this for a reason, you'll see. I'm an only child, but family is very, very important to me, okay? I love food, okay, I can eat all day. I also love music, yo quiero bailar, but I can't, okay? I love to dance, but I'm terrible at it. I have access to a car, can't always afford gas in Boston, but you know, we'll deal with that. And I'm telling you all of this because all of these things about me that make up who I am, that influence my background, the particles of Lauren Melendez, really do influence my attitudes toward health, toward really everything, how I interact with people, interpersonal communication, uh, my relationships, the things I enjoy. The same goes for you. Your backgrounds, how you identify, the people you love, the things you enjoy are all going to influence your attitude towards what you deserve, what you like, especially when it comes to the medical field and access to things that really um, improve our qualities of life, right? So my qualification at this point for being here is that a very special, special, special woman who I have the pleasure of introducing 
just recognize that I'm passionate about these things, right? That I care about this community, about my community, about communities of color. Um, and of course, again, having access to resources that improve our qualities of life. So before we dig in to the meat and bones of this symposium, I have the pleasure of introducing that woman, Joanne Suarez, a public health ethicist, ethicist excuse me, and the founder and executive of uh, direct, executive director, excuse me, of Prospera Institute. When Joanne calls on you, you answer. Okay, so many of you will recognize how incredible she is through the events today. Um, oh, many of you already know her. She's inspired you to be here to take part in this. And so I think we're all very lucky to know her. Joanne is a woman that is deeply motivated to make a difference, right? She has spent her professional life working directly with Latino, Black, and Indigenous, and other marginalized and under-resourced uh, communities. For over a decade, Joanne has served her community through public policy advocacy, crisis management, and strategy. She was chief of staff for Mayor Wu's community engagement cabinet, where she led, get this, a $5 million organization and created a citywide strategic plan to improve the quality of life for Boston residents. This is a bad woman, y'all, okay? I gotta tell you, it gets better. She helped mobilize more than 400 public health practitioners to reform the Massachusetts crisis standard of care policy. This is at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? When we were all running the opposite direction and we wanted to not be bothered, she was working. This directly impacts medical resources in black and Latino communities. I don't think anyone is questioning Joanne's credentials, but we do have to say, just so you know, this Boston native and daughter of Dominican immigrants is the first in her family to attend college, okay? receiving a Master of Bioethics from Harvard Medical School. <laughs> and a Bachelor of Counseling Psychology concentration in medical health and addictions counseling from Johnson Wales University. This woman needs no introduction, but we had to tell you because she's incredible. And I like to tell folks, I read bios, not bullet points, because we're gonna celebrate each and every one of you. I'm gonna do the same for the panelists that I have the pleasure of speaking to in a few moments. But without further ado, we wanna talk about exactly what Prospera Institute is, why it's so important, why you guys are all here, and we wanna bring Joanne up to the stage and give her a warm round of applause. Okay, oh Lord, I said I wasn't gonna cry today, so um, please hold me accountable to that. Um, but thank you all for giving up your Saturday to be here with us today. You guys could have been anywhere today, maybe at home snuggling in your blanket on this rainy day, but you're here with us, so we are grateful for that. Um, before I open up, I do want to acknowledge um, and honor our ancestral lands on behalf of myself and our organization and all of you that are here. Prospera Institute Boston humbly acknowledges the places we eat, sleep, pray, and work, sit within the traditional and ancestral and stolen lands of the Massachusetts Ponkapog peoples, whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We continue to survive by honoring the elders through cultural practices such as expressive arts, areito, storytelling, drumming as you all saw today, prayer and reflection, thus resisting systemic oppression and reclaiming our liberation in the public health sphere and social practices. Today's Health Equity for All Symposium is the product of a vision that I had a couple years ago. Um, I wrote it down at the beginning of the pandemic when I began researching how to convert Latinx Bioethics Inc., now Prospera Institute, into a 501c3 organization. And I am so elated to see this vision come to fruition. It feels like it wasn't long ago when I said I wanted to create a Latinx Bioethics, and some of my close conspirators are in this space with us um, right now. One that centers the beliefs of my community, the values, and the practices that have brought us here today. As Lauren mentioned, I have served the community for a little bit over 12 years, um, and this journey has not been easy. Uh, you'll come to find that in our own journeys, we will have folks that discourage us, but more than most, 
they will encourage us and they will empower us to do what we're doing today. And I am very blessed to have a tribe, including you guys, pushing me and encouraging me to not give up on my visions and my dreams. Um, my board members are in here. They're part of, of those co-conspirators as well, causing good trouble with me. And my niece is here too. We're trying to pass on what doing the good work of justice looks like. Today, the rebranded Prospera Institute is committed to exploring ethical questions in public health at the intersections of race, culture, ethnicity, and social justice. So communities within the Latinx diaspora and all of the diasporas we really share identities with can attain the highest standards of health. Our mission is catalyzed through research, education, and social action, engaging Latino, Black, and Indigenous communities in efforts that advance health equity. And why these particular communities? Because within the Latino diaspora, we are a melting pot. We have a bunch of intersectionalities, including our origins. We come from Spaniards. We come from indigenous folks. We also come from the African diaspora, the motherland. So it's very important that we are precise in our language so folks start to socialize with where we come from. We are proud to say that we are the first minority founded and led public health or public health ethics organization uh, in the country and perhaps in the world. So that is something that you know, we must enjoy. Um, and with not many resources, we have executed over 15 public health ethics initiatives, um, all thanks to our dedicated volunteers, um, both in the United States and Latin American and Caribbean countries. We have galvanized an informal network of over 40 Latino ethicists and have developed a working theoretical framework called the Latinx Bioethics Framework, which we're massaging now, um, that has contributed to how bioethics really thinks about intersectionality when it comes to Latino communities. We only plan to do more as we scale. So today we are publicly announcing that we are launching our capacity building campaign to raise $300,000 by 2026. And these funds will support us in developing our human resource capacity, um, such as getting paid staff to do this important work, establishing our sustainable operational systems, and getting our startup programming off the ground. And if you haven't done so yet, consider supporting us. Um, I want to reiterate how grateful I am in this journey. If it wasn't for all of you that are showing up in this space, for my co-conspirators, my board, my family, I would not be here today. I would not be the woman that I am today, passionate about justice, passionate about making sure that my community has what they need to move forward. I also want to extend a lot of gratitude to our symposium partner, Resilient Sisterhood Project. Uh, this started as a small panel. We, we had a conversation, let's do a panel, and uh, it turned into this. So I think we did good, Lily. <laughs> um, and I want to, of course, thank our sponsors uh, for supporting us and investing in our, in our mission, in our vision. And, really knowing what it takes to get people good health. Uh, our creatives who are here uh, and our volunteers who are also supporting us along the journey. So without further ado, we will get started and we hope that you enjoy the programming today. Thank you. So I'll ask each of you to sort of identify what bioethics means to you. say thank you for having us. Uh, this is a, an honor to be up here with such a distinguished group of, of, of panelists. And thank you to everyone who's here today to listen to us talk about things that we're passionate about and we hope you're passionate about as well. Uh, really hoping to, to create some change here and, and move the ball forward. Um, this is a big question. What mm -hmm. is bioethics? <laughs> uh, this is a question that anyone who has studied bioethics has faced uh, every time they mention it to family and friends. Uh, oh yeah, I'm in a master's program studying bioethics. What is that? Uh, yeah, uh, so 
it means different things to different people. And frankly, the, the field or, or discipline of bioethics is struggling to, to define itself. But I guess that's maybe a little bit incorrect to say that we're struggling. I think we're really thriving in, in expanding what the definition of bioethics is. Um, so although we don't have a specific defined, this is the realm of bioethics, we are seeing that bioethics can be a part of everything that multiple professions do, everyone does. But the real question is how can you be a bioethicist in what you do, rather than what is bioethic bioethics? How do you do bioethics in what you do? Um, but of course, we're focusing on the ethics uh, and moral dilemmas that are presented in health and healthcare. Um, and as we are learning every day, uh, those dilemmas present themselves more and more and in different ways to each person. So really bioethics uh, is defined on an individual basis and how you define it creates a situation for how you approach bioethics in your life and in your jobs. Wow. <laughs> yep. Sure. Um, so thank you again also for having me on this panel. It's really great to be here. Um, so I'm a basic scientist. I'm a researcher. I work with fish. Um, and so the big question is, what is bioethics? So bioethics can be defined as, you know, academically, the social, ethical, legal implications, ethically, of everything that has to do generally with life, with medicine, um, and, and society, good life. Who defines what a good life is, right? Who gets to define what a good life is, what is their good life? Um, from the research perspective, um, a lot of times we think about, okay, philosophically, what, what can this look like? What does this look like? But ultimately, everything that we think about is at, you know, at the end, what do people need? Um, just coming from a human perspective. Um, and how can that be applied? So really, part of my job is not just doing the research, but understanding what are the needs of different communities and peoples that will drive the questions that we ask. And ultimately, how can anything, one thing that I do in my lab or in the context of a group of laboratories actually impact people, health, and health equity and understanding how to do that. So that's how I understand bioethics and how I try to think about it in terms of how I do my job every day. Yeah, yeah Valerie, that is um, very beautifully said. And um, as you all know, I am a public health ethicist. And under the umbrella of bioethics, there are many sub umbrellas and public health ethics is one of them. I come from a background of working in communities. So the way that I perceive bioethics um, in a clinical space, or as Valerie was saying, in a research space, you're more in a, a intimate interaction thinking about from the bench to the patient or from patient care, um, from the doctor-patient relationship. But in public health ethics, we think in the context of communities. So from my vantage point, I think about all these philosophical questions, which I will not bore you with, of how we can really increase and maximize benefits for communities, whether that is through public policy, whether it is through programming, whether it is even in the home, because I have worked in spaces and communities where health really does begin at home. What are we doing in our homes to nurture our bodies? What are we surrounding ourselves with? And how does that manifest in the public context that then informs our institutions? So a lot of big questions because we're dealing with populations, but that is the way that I approach um, bioethics uh, with always thinking about how is my community um, who may not know about this field going to um, benefit from what we are putting out for them? I also want to say uh, thank you so much, Joanne, for having me here. I do want to say she is my mentor at the uh, master's program that I'm in. And I am so happy and honored to be her mentee. And for uh, thank you to her for having me here. Um, as someone that's very early in sort of my bioethics career and hoping to explore more, this is an incredible opportunity. And, and it's really funny, it's a great question, and I love kind of what Casey said. It, it's really difficult to, to define, and actually on our, one of our first day of classes, that is essentially the question that we talked about for a good chunk of that class, is what really is it? And everyone had a very distinct definition, and I think um, what it means kind of to me broadly is essentially trying to sort of explore and address ethical dilemmas 
in pretty much any field, as kind of Casey was mentioning, any, any field possible, you can really apply it. And it pulls from everything like, uh, you know, religion, it pulls from law and uh, philosophy, medicine, and really trying to kind of think about what it truly means to, to do good by people, to provide people with what it is they need, how we like have to uh, approach any sort of day-to-day -day issue or day-to-day -day problem, day-to-day -day question. And for me specifically as someone who um, was aspiring to be a physician and especially wanting to work with kids, um, you know, I want to be sure that I'm approaching any sort of question, any sort of, uh, of case in a way where I'm really thinking about why am I making the choices that I'm making for this patient, for their family, for their health, for their well-being, not just specifically in how am I going to cure this disease, but what am I doing for them as a person? Am I really approaching this in a way that is best for them and not just what I think is best for them? but really thinking about these core issues at the base and making sure that I'm kind of gathering all these tools so that I can think about them in a case-by-case -case basis and really think about the human and what is the right thing for them. Um, and at the same time, also, as someone who wants to continue to engage in, in community work as a physician, I want to make sure that I'm also asking the right questions and considering the right approaches when I'm working with different communities. Because you know, as as uh, some of us have mentioned, you know, we want to make sure we elevate community voices, elevate community values, and I uh, really want to make sure that we're thinking about how we're doing that and why we're doing the things that we're doing, and making sure that uh, you know we do our best to do the best by anyone that we're trying to help. I want to piggyback off that. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to put it out. Um, because I think while we're in this space, getting to know one another, it's important to sort of find out why you're here what brought you into this field? Was there an experience? Was there a death in the family? Was there an aha moment? Because a lot of why people take on a field like this, which my, my, I'm reading your bios and I'm like, my goodness, all I, I did journalism, like, wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what brought you to this field? Each of you were kind of make our way down. Um, and I would invite the audience as well to think about why you're here. You know, is there some piece of information that you're taking back to your Nana or your abuelita or your stubborn uncle that you're like, they hit the nail on that. Uh, yeah, I can go ahead and start with we'll work backwards. Um, I think I already sort of touched on it a little bit. Um, and there's, a, it's kind of a twofold in a sense. One, as I mentioned, is sort of the community work that I've been involved in. I want to continue to be involved in. I want to make sure that I have that right approach. Um, I think as someone who grew up and was sort of helped, uh, helped on my path by my community and by people around my community, it's really important for me to continue to, to explore what that truly means and try to give back to not only the kind of communities that I felt that I was a part of, but also any other community that needs that support, that needs that help. Um, and I think you know, as, as, you, as you try to sort of, uh, in college and as you're a young person, try to engage in this type of work, a lot of times you, you realize down the road that you're engaging in it in the wrong way. Um, sometimes it's because you just don't know, sometimes it's because you got it the wrong way, and sometimes you're well-intentioned, but you just don't really take the time to really think about what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. And so I want to make sure that I'm taking the time to truly, you know, get to the, to the basics and the core of how this work should be done and why it should be done. And then on the other hand as well, um, as someone that wants to work with children and as someone who's going to ideally train um, to help uh, kids and families who have been, who are facing really difficult times in their lives, uh, where it is they're diagnosed with a terminal illness or just a chronic illness that's going to really change their life. Um, I want to sort of have the tools to help support that family in any way possible, not just medically, and to also help them make difficult decisions that a lot of these families have to make and that all of these kids have to make that will affect the rest of their life or as they approach the end of their life, unfortunately. And those are really difficult, tough questions for them. And I want to kind of gather some of the tools that I can to be able to help support them and sort of uh, be this person that engages with them in some of the most difficult times of their life. And I think bioethics can really help get to the core of how to approach a lot of these decisions. Yeah. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I'm more in the how to help communities collectively make that decision um, or those decisions or sometimes not agree at all, which is also a, 
a decision. Um, but I come to this work personally because at the age of 10, I suffered a traumatic brain injury. Um, and my family had to make some of those tough decisions. Um, my mother immigrated here from Dominican Republic, so her first language is not English. And she was faced with a team of doctors telling her, your daughter may not live to see tomorrow. And that is something very tough for a parent to digest um, or to either think about, oh my God, there's all of these decisions I have to make. My kid was just running yesterday and today she may not live to see tomorrow. Um, luckily I'm here today, um, but in that process I was also the person in my family that everyone came to for decisions. I was the translator, the social worker, the lawyer, the everything. So I, I think that I was a bioethicist when I was 10 years old. <laughs> I just didn't know yet. So that's how I come to this work. And of course, like loving my community like you, you know, I was raised by, it takes a village. Uh, some of my village are here today. And they keep me grounded. They allow me to discern uh, what is important and what may not be important, what is a priority, and um, what are the tough decisions that we need to make in order to move forward. So uh, I think that that's what brings me to this work. Oh, you got your own yeah. mic. Mm -hmm. this is, oh, that's this my myself. <laughs> That was really beautiful, and I think I resonate a lot with like the, the being bioethicist kind of without knowing what it is, kind of growing up, right? Um, so my family's from Uruguay, um, from South America, and so growing up, I grew up in Portchester. It's majority Latin, Latinx, um, Hispanic, and then I went to, um, to Duke, primarily white opulence, right? It was just complete, complete flip. And so growing up, yes, we noticed some, some things that we had to, I was also a translator, like the same, same kinds of things. Um, but then it was just so exacerbated and obvious. Um, and at the time, I was also doing cell biology, which is I had just always wanted to be a scientist. I didn't know what that meant. But I was also doing a religion degree because just I felt that's where my mind was going, right? Like this is what the kinds of things that I'm thinking about and being able to kind of think about both of them and other themes um, throughout. And so how do I come to, to bioethics? So one of the things that I, I think a lot about, especially in academia and especially in primarily white institutions, is the, the power that exists, and especially power over patients, students, uh, kind of across the scales, and how throughout working with communities, um, and, and um, in my case, um, Latinx affinity communities from high school all the way up to present, it's really okay, how do we convert that into power with, power to, um, and especially as we, we ourselves grow up in our own professions, how do we translate that into the actual work that we do? So a lot of times in, in basic science research, you know, we're very focused on this really tiny question that really probably only you care, <laughs> care about um, with larger implications. But I think there's a, an important aspect of um, Part of the other work that I do is, is diversifying the people themselves doing this kind of work, right? Driving the questions, asking the questions. Um, and so that's kind of how I fell into bioethics. And I think the actual training, like the official training that I received um, through Yale School, th through the Yale University was after pandemic. And it was just so in your face. And it's, we're really not, I, sorry, I was not trained with bioethics really in the curriculum or really integrated. And I think that's, um, a really um, lost opportunity for the generation of, of scientists that we could be if it was just integrated a little bit more. Yeah, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to because I to see who I'm talking to here. Um, so hello, everyone I didn't see earlier. Uh, good morning. Um, what brings me to bioethics, uh, it, I guess, would say uh, it, 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 it's not just one thing. Right. Uh, it evolves over time. You become a bioethicist the more issues and problems you see in the world and with our healthcare system. Uh, I was diagnosed with diabetes, type 1 diabetes, when I was about 12 years old. Uh, and for about two years, I was living with diabetes, not really understanding what that meant. Uh, because I had not lived in a, in a, in a system, in a structure that uh, catered to type 1 diabetics. There wasn't nutritional information on my lunch at school. I didn't know how many carbohydrates I was eating 
uh, at breakfast, at lunch, at the after school snack before sports. That's stuff I need to know in order to stay alive, in order to know how much insulin to give myself. And then I went to uh, a camp, a camp that was dedicated to type 1 diabetics. Uh, my, my mother had sent me there um, because she thought I could learn some things about how to manage my diabetes. And she was right. I learned what I deserve from, uh, from systems, from people who are giving me food, from people who are taking care of me throughout the day, from my school who seed me, saw me more than my family saw me, right? Uh, so I, I, I learned that systems weren't created for everybody. Um, and for the first time in my life, I felt like that was very unfair. And I, my eyes were opened to all the inequities that exist on a day-to-day basis. For, for 10 to 12 years, I lived without thinking about what I was eating. Now I had to think about what I was eating. Then I started thinking about, well, what about those people with uh, peanut allergies or other allergies? They have to think about what they're eating, too. How, how do they know what's in their food? My eyes were opened. That's when I started thinking philosophically about my day-to-day -day life. And when I started thinking about bioethics on a more academic level, that was when I was practicing law. Uh, when I was practicing law, I was defending doctors, hospitals, healthcare professionals, and entities. Um, but what I saw was that the problems weren't with the people. The problems were with the systems. Again, systemic issues causing problems that then physicians, healthcare professionals, and entities were trying to fix, trying to work downstream on. And then when something went wrong, I was there as a lawyer to say, well, that was wrong. And here's how much money we're going to give you to make it right. And I, I hated that. I fell in love with the law because of the philosophy underlying it. The practice of it was, was less attractive to me. So I decided to transition and study uh, bioethics because I found that to be the place where I could be most effective at changing systems. Uh, I didn't want to change systems to save money for companies. I didn't want to change systems to prevent lawsuits from happening. These, these things happen. What I wanted to do is change systems so that people could be treated like humans and be seen as individuals for who they are. And I thought the bioethics program was the, the place that would equip me with the tools to do that, equip me with the networks to do that. I've met Joanne there. So we're doing this, this work because we saw a similar vision for ourselves in, in making change and creating uh, this change in ways that caters to people who haven't been seen at all times. The 12-year-old diabetic Casey. Uh, the, 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 someone who, the, 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 the Joanne with a, with a brain injury, right? Seeing people as people, uh, I, I think that is the, the, the center of what brought me to this work and what I continue to try to center in my work today. So, uh, you, Casey, you and Valerie both brought up really good points that I want to piggyback off of in terms of education, right? So. Unfortunately, you had to go and seek a degree and, and a focus in something like this. We typically grow up, we think of math, science, social studies, reading, you know, that sort of thing as the main categories in terms of our education, right? We don't really think about financial literacy or nutrition or bioethics, right? So our schools, and I don't mean just like, you know, middle school, college, all of them, are, are we doing enough, are they doing enough to integrate bioethics? Is there a way, and that, you know, that's a loaded question as well, but is there a way that they could introduce something like this into curriculums earlier or, or better, or just building curriculums to ask these questions so that we don't have to wait till we're 12 years old and our body is, is rejecting things and, and you know, we're, we're faced with life and death situations because we don't know what we don't know. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off, and then I saw you taking notes. So I'm going to <laughs> <you>. <laughs> um, I absolutely do think that we should introduce younger folks. Actually, there is a curriculum. I believe the NIH developed it um, for high schoolers, but unfortunately, we have not been able to deploy that curriculum in schools effectively. Um, I do think that the younger that we are, and we are socialized um, to bioethics, which is a really big word, um, so we're, we're working on that. We're trying to figure out how to pour it down people's throats. Yeah, but I do think that if as kids, you know, as they're forming their own moral conception of the world, if they have the capacity to um, really start thinking about how to formulate questions uh, from a personal standpoint, then as we get older, we will be sending them off for success. Because as Casey noted and, and my colleagues, 
Bioethics is not something that only applies to health and medicine. It, it applies to business. It applies to any any field. So, you know, whether you're the community organizer, you have to make decisions for your community, and that starts in your home. And the quicker that we equip you to start thinking about that, not only philosophically but practically, then you will be more successful in your practice. Yeah, I think. Um so certainly I touched on it that there is a greater need to integrate into existing curricula um, from, from primary school up. And I think some of the topics that you mentioned, right, so math, science, um, history, so those are, are very necessary. Um, without integrating some of these other tools um, and curriculum that, that really press for critical thinking and imagining what could be possible, right, it, I think um, it serves more of a utilitarian type thing. Like what's, what's useful right now, um, ultimately for usually capitalist purposes, versus saying what do people, you know, what are the greatest needs, right? And being able to identify those. Um, and so certainly, you know, I didn't even know about the high school curriculum and yeah. I'm in this field, right? And so as a high schooler, I wouldn't, I have no idea except what I am surrounded by at that stage, what I can observe. Um, now the internet's a lot more ubiquitous than when I was in high school. Chat GPT, Chat GPT yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's a, one of the greater needs, not, not even at the college level, just throughout, integrated throughout the curriculum in the schools. I'll follow up on that, and uh, I'm going to create a little bit of an analogy here, because sports is such a big part of my background. Um, I don't think you teach uh, a six-year-old how to play basketball by looking at stats and how to defend a pick and roll against a shooter who is uh, shooting 43% from the three-point line, right? It, you, you tell them to have fun. You first tell them, have fun. So how do you teach bioethics? You don't, we don't get into like normative principles. We don't get into real philosophical theory. We teach them about how to be a human and how to treat humans as individuals. Lots of times people say, well, that starts at home. Yeah, sure, maybe it does, but it can also start at school. It can start on the playground. It can start on those sports fields. Although it's a difficult topic to define, a difficult topic to really explain the complexities of, teaching to children is, is the same as anything else. You break it down, and, and, and I think really at the basis of it, we talk bioethics, bio meaning life. What's, what's important? Human lives, environmental life. I mean, it, it expands beyond, but at the beginning, it is about life and thriving lives and how we treat one another and how we be a human in a human community. So uh, yeah, I think the earlier, the better. The, uh, it makes it easier to process the more complex issues in bioethics the earlier in you introduce these, these topics. Um, but start with basic con uh, concepts, of course, um, concepts about compassion and caring for one another and, and how to live in a community in a responsible uh, and compassionate way. Um, so I think that's where it starts. Christian, did you want to add? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that was all beautifully said by all of you. And, and I think that's kind of, uh, I like that line of thinking is, you know, the earlier that we can present these sort of ideas to, to kids, and like you said, thinking about how to be a good classmate, how to be a good friend, how to, you know, how to help others on the playground, how to treat your teammates, how to approach your family, things like that. All these questions can be addressed sort of by some of the basic principles of, of bioethics that we can, that we. So guys, thumbs it up. Oh, what's happening? I don't know if that was. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just ignore that. I think they're agreeing with you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, earlier we, that we can present it, the earlier they can start thinking about these ideas and really sort of think about how, they're, how they are sort of presenting themselves in their community, in their family, at their school, and that can really kind of carry on as they grow up, as they approach their careers, whatever it is. And like we said, bioethics can apply to really anything. And I do want to add also a bit, um, as someone who is currently in medical school as well, we do not get enough ethics at all. And that's coming from someone who's at a school that actually does have some ethics curriculum more than other medical schools do. And you know, we, we are saying bioethics can apply to everything, but it's very obvious that it does apply to medicine, and it's not present nearly enough. And I think that's one of the major issues in how a lot of physicians and a lot of healthcare workers approach their work, 
and why so many uh, community members, patients, families are unhappy with how they are treated and their experiences in medicine. And it's all c completely valid, valid. And I think there's a lot of ways that we can fix that for sure. But I think one main way is to kind of um, include bioethics in sort of any sort of health related curriculum as a start. And yes, we should continue building it in every single training for every kid in school. But in medical school in particular, from the very beginning, we need to do more of it. And you know, um, I did learn some bioethics in medical school, but the very basics. And I think they were things that were very helpful and allowed me to think through a lot of things that were helpful uh, in sort of my training, but it wasn't nearly enough. And I was like, oh, I want to learn about this more. This is interesting. And now that I'm starting, I'm only a month into this program, but I'm already realizing how much more I'm learning and how valuable this would be to any person that's training to be a physician and any person that's training to be in healthcare at all. Um, and so I 100% think that this should be way more emphasized in sort of any medical school in, in the country. I love the way that you framed sort of, you know, essentially meeting people where they are, right? Like, what do they need? What do they enjoy? Casey brought up sports. I wouldn't know a touchdown if it slapped me in the face. But, you know, <laughs> I, I love food. I love dancing. I said I love music earlier. So how important is it that a lawyer, a doctor, a physician, um, a, a house of worship, look where we are, um, that these elements of community, um, of bio, life, ethics, are integrated into our, our care plans, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. think about how important music is to our family. Think about how important the recipe that your grandma passed down. So yeah. do yeah. do doctors and do these professional settings have more responsibility to think more holistically about how they introduce people um, to, to medicine? Yeah. I don't want to brag, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that our house of worship does a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I joined this church. Um, I went through, you know, a couple churches, and then when I got here, um, I was like, oh wow, they. It's not only the pastors doing the work, mm -hmm. but it's the people in the congregation doing the work. And to elaborate on that, like this past week, we had like a end of life planning uh, worship where we're actually addressing the real issues that people that come to worship with us are dealing with. Um, you know, we have members in our congregation that are caretakers, um, that are community uh, workers like myself, um, students that are in, on their journey to medical school. So I do think that, um, you know, we do a very good job at that, but also individually, you have to you have to think about what is going to you know the utility of it like a utilitarian perspective what is practical now and what do i need what resources do i need to uh, accomplish that and that starts with addressing the real questions in front of you i just I'm, i want to piggyback off that because we brought the, you brought the information here people are in the community they didn't have to catch 18 buses and go yeah. to a different part of town to get information on health equity or you know anything else under this roof so we think about the hair salon the barber shop okay. the sports field those places that are important to us again do these places do these professional settings need to think about the person the whole person yeah. more as they integrate you know health and care plans yeah and i think that that's one of our goals at prospera like we um we are set to be a, a rigorous research community. But one of the things that stood out for me and Casey, this is how Casey and I joined forces, was in the classroom, um, bioethics and healthcare is like very ivory tower, especially at Harvard Medical School. Similar to you, I came from like, you know, nitty gritty, working in Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan and, um, like reaching people in the community directly, like, hey, you want to take your blood pressure? Come here, come. Let, let's do that right now on the on the corner. So when I got to the program, um, there was like these very high level conversations about, oh, this is how healthcare is, and this is, and it felt so removed. And mind you, I walked ten minutes, ten to fifteen minute walk to get to the center for bioethics. So I was crossing a train track, and then my whole world changed. Right. I had to walk through the projects and 
through you know a, a street that is like full of unhealthy foods and and I was and then I get to these conversations and I was like whoa where is community in this how do I take this um, back to my clients and translate it for them and I and I was very vocal about this is not practical for us. Um, who are working in community. So that's one of my priorities to make sure that um, whatever we're doing that's very academically rigorous, which we understand because we have an ivory tower in our heads, we have to make sure um, that we have the language to translate it for communities because I cannot go to a community member and say, well, the philosophical principles <laughs> of blah, blah, blah are such and such. They're going to look at me like, uh, no, thank you. To the left, I'm going over here. <laughs> yeah, very well said. I think one of the points that you brought up also, so coming from Ivory Tower, supposedly, um, there's sometimes a lack of self-awareness of just how... Um, homogenous, some, some viewpoints may be. Um, I think some of the things that may be necessary <laughs> for, for that is, um, so, so medicine tends to be a, little, a bit paternalistic, so like we, we know better than you about your own body and your own experiences, and you know, we're t we are telling you this is what you need, versus bringing in the more holistic, like actual understanding, humility, like we, we know nothing about you until you share whatever you are willing to share. Right, um, so I think that is a um, is a big need in terms of integrating kind of across across different fe any any field really um, humility and listening, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, to people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Did anyone else want to address that and then move on? Christian, did you? No. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk about a little bit more on the granular level. How can and you brought this up as well? How can we all be a bioethicist? Right? Is it as simple as Something that Joe, I mean, I, I, you're better than me because if I'm taking somebody's blood pressure, you don't want me to do it. But that's exactly <laughs> that, you know, that you're thinking that what you might have it in your purse and you see someone, you know, really going through a crisis and go, oh, something's wrong. Yeah. Um, is it as simple as you overhear a conversation when you're out and somebody's ragging on, oh, those doctors don't care about us and, and say, uh-uh, no, because I know a woman named Joe in Flores who just had this event and they do care and this is where you can get resources. You know, are there ways every day, I mean, on a very simplistic level that we can contribute to the betterment and, and not recycle these negative conversations about health equity and access and quite literally pass this information on and not be gatekeepers? Yeah, I'll kick us off and then we can all. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm grappling, uh, both as an individual and as part of a community, is the way that we are defining community engagement um, and the way that we are engaging with community engagement um, from an outsider's perspective is very transactional. Um, and I don't like that because my community does not like that. So when we think about community engagement, um, who from the community are you engaging and why are you engaging them? And sometimes we tend to fall on uh, the comfort of not wanting to pull in that disgruntled community member because they may say something provocative, but maybe that's the person that needs to be at the table mm -hmm. because they're gonna provoke you to think differently. You may not like what they have to say, you don't have to like it, but you do have to respect their point of view um, and respect that this is someone that is a recipient of what you are bringing to the community. So that is one of the things that I think on a granular level that um, as practitioners and also folks that are part of communities is really intentionally engaging with community and not in a transactional way, not picking the same people that serve on the com on the committees because they happen to live in that community, but no, like thinking outside the box. Um, like one of the things that I do to engage with my community is every now and then, um, I'll take a walk like into Marshalls or into the cafe and I know the people by their name. And they know me too because my dog always is with me so they know, they know Bandit before they know me. So just having conversations with them um, so that when it comes time to have those difficult conversations, it's easier. And that's how we vaccinated almost everyone in East Boston because we are very closely engaged and we know the people, they know us by our first name and we include them in our work. Yep. Um, so one of the points that, that you brought up, I think, um, was the gatekeeping. So I think one of the, main, one of the things that I 
do, so every, so professionally, but also every day is, so give access, give access to information. Um, if I have the power to give, <laughs> you know, um, translate things, but you know, from personal experience, um, you know, there's some things that sh should not be a secret, <laughs> especially in like government forms. Oh my goodness, right? Um, so I think that's one of the the greater um, the greater needs for that. Um, yeah. It could Stop be there. Another, yeah. another thing that you said sharing, you could be like reposting something on TikTok, you know, that the, yeah. your friends, you know, watching yeah, that, really anything, yeah. offering a ride to the doctor. Hey, I'm going to go down to the clinic this week. Do you need, do you need help? Like, I mean, every day, like super easy ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's actually a really great point. And exactly what I wanted to say was uh, these conversations don't have to be in academic centers or in healthcare institutions. These conversations are in everyday life. They're all happening on Twitter, they're happening uh, via text, they're happening on TikTok. These conversations should be happening, but the, the problem is how do you identify these issues yeah. in the first place if you don't have the education to, to see them for what they really are, the complex issues? It's just having these conversations, talking about them with your friends, with your family. What, what makes you mad? Yeah. One of my professors told, when I struggled writing a paper, I said, all right, well, what's, what pisses you off right now? Yeah. And I said, well, this insurance coverage of an <laughs> insulin pump situation. He said, all right, write about that. Yeah. That's the best paper I wrote in the whole program. Yeah. Because I wrote about what made me mad. Yeah. What lit a flame under me. Yeah. Right? And so when I'm thinking about what to do, how to make change on a granular level, I'm thinking, what wow, mad? what do I see needs to change? The reason I am doing my job well is because I bring my experience to it. I am myself. I bring me. And I expect that from others. Mm -hmm. We're up here because we have different experiences. And all of our experiences are helping this conversation move forward. Yeah. And so when you bring yourself to conversations, I think you will find that other people bring themselves to the conversations as well. And you learn so much more. Be willing to learn from those around you. Of course, they might be your friends, you've known them for decades, but all of a sudden you learn that they had uh, a grandmother who's in hospice and there's this certain situation that they've never dealt with, but hey, I actually know exactly how to navigate the system. I've been lucky to, 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 to go through and, 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 and law school and understand how insurance programs work and how the healthcare system works. I can bring that to them. So find ways that you can bring yourself forward in your work with others, in your relationships with others, and you will find that you are doing bioethics immediately. Yeah. Find the bioethics within yourself by looking within yourself to see who you are and who you are in your relationships with your friends and family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I think I, I want to kind of talk along the same lines of, of what my colleagues did, and it's a lot of really great points, and a lot of the ways that we can sort of bring bioethics to, to more people is, you know, when we find something that makes us mad, when we find an issue that really affects us, our community, our family members, something that, that really needs to change, we can, you know, seek to learn a bit more about it. And then once we learn more about it, you know, talk to others about it, share that knowledge, talk to others about why this is an issue and what can be done and what's at the core of it and really talk to you know, other members of your community, friends, family, anybody, and really try to share that. And I think as someone who, um, you know, my parents both uh, came as immigrants from Mexico. I was, you know, first generation to go to college, first generation to kind of be involved in all this academia, to grow up here in the US and, and see all of these issues. And when I go back to, to my community, there's a lot of distrust in medicine, a lot of distrust in any sort of big institution, especially academia. A lot of distrust in, distrust in the institutions that I've kind of gotten my education at. And I think we can't take those kinds of things personally because they have very good reasons to feel that way. They have very good reasons to be scared to go to the doctor, to be scared to go to the, uh, the city hall for whatever they need to go and, and feel like they're not there to help me. They're not there for me. They're there for themselves. They're there for other people. They're not there to help me. And we need to really try and, you know, first educate ourselves, help educate others, and then use that, that knowledge and use that power and use our community to help get in there and make those changes. And I think that's, you know, a lot of the reason that a lot of us are in bioethics and a lot of us are in some of these circles that we're not necessarily happy to be in, but that we should appreciate that we can be a part of to take all that knowledge, be in those spaces, bring new voices to that space, and really try to, um, 
to try to shift a lot of uh, sort of the what is currently a priority, right? Because whoever kind of sit that, sits at those tables gets to decide what issues are a priority and what are we going to do to address them. So if we're not in those spaces, we can't shift those conversations and sort of change what needs to change for our communities because we're not being heard, we're not there. And even if people in that room are well-intentioned, well they might not fully understand what it is at the core of you know, what the community needs, needs are, but we are, so right. we can educate ourselves, we can try to find our ways, our ways in there and share as much as possible with others. If the concept of this panel, just this panel, but for all of you, I want you to think of this entire day. If the concept of this panel, arts and health, were itself a form of art, what form would it be and why? And so we're just gonna go allow these people to introduce themselves and they'll answer that question as they go. We're gonna start with Lily. Oh, and you get, yeah, here, you can have that. And the question? If the, if the concept of this panel were a form of art, what form would? Oh. I did give it to him ahead of time. Yes, yes, you did, yes. yes. <laughs> just um, I, th well, thank you um, for coming to spend your Saturday with us. I am also delighted to be um, in the company of each one of you. I think it would be in the form of a quilt. Um, and the reason I, I believe um, so it's because when I think of a quilt, um, I, I see quilt, quilt is, quilt, quilt is an art making. Um, that can be a solitary endeavor, but also a collective endeavor. Um, but no matter how you choose, whether you choose to um, be a quilt maker uh, or uh, by, as oneself, or whether you choose to have it as, an, as a collective endeavor, I believe there is so much to gain and engage um, and, and to really get from uh, quilt making. And, I also, uh, and also as I think of quilt, I'm really thinking about how the, um, the process of making quilt was so essential to the lives of our ancestors. I mean, quilt making is still very much a very rich tradition um, in the African American co um, community, but I think about how for our ancestors um, b being enslaved, how mending the art of like you know, I'm not sure whether they were really thinking of it as like, I'm quilting. I think, I think it was more of an art as mending to um, mend the little pieces of um, clothing that they had. Whether it was to um, use um, different pieces of fabric to create a quilt as to cover themselves to, for warmth. Um, or whether they needed to mend it to, um, to create what, you know, maybe perhaps for small decorations. But I really think it would be in a form of a quilt. And also through quilting, and I do believe, especially our ancestors, I don't think it was a solitary endeavor. I think it was also part of the time when they had to themselves where they were not under the watchful eyes of um, or the praying eyes of the enslavers, where they could be, um, they were under the gaze of each other, where they were, um, they, where they could see each other, speak with each other, really taking the time for storytelling, and doing it in a circle, and doing it in doing it in a circle through the little bit of food that they have. So that's my answer. Thank you. So before we go on, I'm going to have you do this each as you uh, start. So Lily, can you talk about your role or the Brazilian Sisterhood Project's role in bridging arts and health to advance equity? Thank you for asking that question. Um, so perhaps some of you who are here might know that um, the Resilient Sisterhood Project, we um, currently have an art exhibition that's being hosted at Harvard University. Um, we, we had the opening ceremony in March, and um, actually the 
exhibition was supposed to end at the end of this month, but due to popular demand, it's been extended until the end of the year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I actually brought some information that's on the back table about the art exhibition, even though the brochure says um, October 31st, but it will be open until the end of the year. So um, I actually started the Resilient Sisterhood um, project through storytelling. I, again, for people who know me, from the time I was 22 years old, I found myself working with survivors of domestic violence, gender-based violence, um, around gender-based violence, whether it was incest, um, domestic violence, sexual violence, or, hum or uh, human trafficking. In the process of working with many of these women for years and years and years, I also noticed that they were dealing with many reproductive health issues. Um, and so I decided that I really needed to try to talk to many of these women. And they certainly, uh, they needed a lot of help. But I noticed that many of the reproductive health issues they were dealing with were issues that, you know, I had family members or friends or other colleagues dealt with, and they never, ever, ever talk about them. So I decided that, hmm, let me make a list of people and see even if 1% of the folks on the list would speak to me about their reproductive health issues. It turns out that everyone on that list spoke with me and then referred me to speak to sisters, mothers, you know, other friends. And we met at kitchen tables, we met uh, in sitting on the floor in living rooms, and, um, and I heard many, 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 many stories. And, and many of these women urged me to do something, hence the genesis of the Resilient Sisterhood Project. Storytelling, I think, is at the core of everything that we're doing. The, you know, the panel we had this morning, if we think about everyone who spoke, at the core of everything they say, was there a story? Yes. From the very beginning of that panel until the very end. So I quickly learned the, you know, um, the importance of storytelling. So storytelling led me to start the Resilient Sisterhood Project. But I'll quickly tell you, when I also learned about the plight of some enslaved women whose bodies were used for medical experiments by um, a small plantation doctor back in the 1840s, Dr. Marion Sims, who's known as the father of modern gynecology, and who used the bodies of three enslaved women. As I said women, I should say that they were, they were adolescent girls. He talked specifically about three of them, Annika, Betsy, and Lucy. Annika herself was 17. Lucy and Betsy were 18 years old. Hardly really women. It would not have mattered if they were 35, 95, or, or 55 for what, uh, you know, the cruelties that they had to endure at the hand of Dr. Sims. But they were young girls. So upon learning their stories and upon learning how Sims is well known as a father of modern gynecology, how, how he's well celebrated. And yet we know very little about these ancestors. And also realizing that before Sims, there were plenty of Sims. After Sims, we continued to have other Sims. So I felt that, um, and I was really distressed upon learning what happened to these young women. I was also distressed that I was in my 40s when I learned about the plight of these ancestors. And, and I'm thinking how as black people, black and brown people, how little we know about our own story. So I felt that um, it was important that I made a promise. I actually, I made a promise, but I felt a call by the ancestors. I wasn't sure what that call was going to be. I knew that I had to do something. It took many, many years, and that response from that call came in the form of art, where I did, you know, the ancestors, I did lift <laughs> that into, you know, once I realized what I could do, I lifted that response out to the ancestors to really guide me to come on my path and to send along other folks. And they certainly did. And so I was able to um, commit, raise money by, um, to raise the money by, some really kind people who understood what I wanted to do and commissioned a series of six paintings 
where right now they are to really, to chronicle, to tell an arc narrative, to tell the stories of these women. Because I think it's really important that we use art and we use storytelling to really t uh, talk about art, to make sure that we reflect the perspectives and narratives of, that have been dismissed, um, um, na narratives that, want, that other, um, others want to erase. Um, so I think it's important that we use storytelling as an art you know, to awake um, curiosity, um, to find pride, but also to put values in who we are to raise our humanity, to um, cherish, um, to remember, because remembering is an act of justice. Remembering is an act of compassion um, and, and, and an act of empathy. So storytelling and art can absolutely help us to do that. Thank you, Lily. I feel like that, that your, your entire, entire discussion, discussion there, there has, has been, been a quilt. Of bringing, right. <laughs> bringing the pieces together, repeating a pattern, et cetera. So. But you don't want me to get started on quilting because I can go on about that. Okay, next I'm happy to introduce uh, Vanessa. And Vanessa, what is your answer to our question? Uh, to your first question about the form of art, um, so as the community outreach coordinator for the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, um, what I see as the art of community outreach is um, basket weaving. And so, you know, talking about my ancestors, and you can obviously see I have um, a, a shirt with um, a woven print from Puebla, um, which is very close to where I grew up, Mexico City and uh, Michoacan, where my family has been, um, is from and has lived for a long time. Um, I love art in which you can still very clearly see the artisan's hand. Um, and so whether, you know, it's this shirt or some of the baskets that we weave, um, they are, you know, fit for purpose. You want a basket to be, you know, really sturdy for each strand to reinforce the other, um, for it to be able to hold and contain um, everything that is within it. Um, and I think that community outreach um, between, you know, some of these um, healthcare institutions and community members, um, it reinforces that every strand is really vital. Any one of those strands, you know, at the basket begins to fray, any one of them is missing, um, and you lose functionality, you lose purpose, you know, like you have just a lot of material without the ability to actually hold the whole. And so I think that um, my work in community I outreach. I seriously want to go to a museum with these people, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> fantastic. Okay, so Vanessa, can you tell us a little bit about. Um, your kind of, you know, your multi, multiple lensed arm in terms of the role of bridging arts and health to advance equity in your work? Yeah, I think um, I always go back to my first career um, where I was a registered dietitian at a community health center. And um, it was a federally qualified health center. And um, it was in East Austin. I was seeing primarily uh, people that were in the downtown area, um, a lot of uh, Latin folks, a lot of speaking Spanish every day, which was beautiful for me, um, a lot of you know, uh, people from the um, um, black community that is historic of East Austin, and then also a huge like refugee and migrant community. Um, and when you're talking about you know all of these different conditions, whether it was you know diabetes, hypertension, whatever it might be, um, all of these are really scary sometimes. Um, but the conversation that was most effective in creating behavior change or making people uh, more aware of what prosperity and like what well-being is um, centers on questions of meaning, you know, what makes your life meaningful, what relationships strengthen your relationship to self, what inspires you, what makes you feel most alive, um, and that was really the focus of our conversations and how I learned the importance of listening and then working in public policy um, and translating, pe helping people translate some of their stories, some of their narratives um, into something that could be shared publicly and that could help to like these uh, politicians, decision makers, reinforce um, the values that they already hold um, to working with larger institutions. Um, I would say that the uh, Undiagnosed Diseases Network being you know, the most successful research study um, coming out of the NIH Common Fund, um, you know, it's still a somewhat small 
you know, fish in like a really, really big sea of research, but at the same time, um, in community outreach, I think that when you have an organization that comes to you and says, we wanna live up to our highest aspiration, you know, we hear the stories of people who are saying, I, you know, I have all these sets of conditions that no one can explain. I feel all of these things and people tell me it's nothing, but I know that like I have something happening to me. Um, it's a place that really listens and it's a place that lifts up um, how people are really um, going through their lives and through their days. Um, and when an organization comes and says, we want everyone to know that this is a resource that is accessible, um, that this is a resource that's already out there to help and that we care, um, I think that that is sort of like the sweet spot of community outreach where you're able to listen to people, where you're able to capture their stories and then connect them with the resources that will enable them to live more prosperous and fulfilling and healthy lives. Well, let me tell you, you're an excellent storyteller. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was great. The work that you did in Texas, it really reminds me a lot of the um, Mass Cultural Center, you know, like what engages you, what makes you alive, you know? And sometimes people have to go back really far, right? I think they've said, when I was seven, I played soccer every day and that was the most meaningful thing. And you have to go like, how can we build that bridge to re-inspire that? Okay, mm. now, oh, mm -hmm. I'm very happy to reintroduce to you Jean, who is going to give us his own brilliant answer to if this panel were a form of art, what would it be? Thank you. Um, is it some more afternoon? Good afternoon, everyone. So pleased to be here. Shout out to Councillor Woodsy in the back. Great to see you. Um, first of all, Lily, you're amazing. Let's just start there. I mean, I think the work you're doing is phenomenal and thank you for doing it. Um, and Lauren and I from the Undiagnosed Undi Disease Network were just talking about making a plan to go see that exhibit. So we will definitely check it. Can you, can you take me to? Yes, we would love to have you. I mean, I feel like between Lily and Vanessa, you could just do the panel between them and I'll yeah. just listen. <laughs> Um, really, but the work that I, I think if this panel were to be an art form, it would have to be portraiture. Um, the reason why I really admire, I mean, there are many reasons why I admire the work of portraiture because it says something about the person. It says something about the people, if it's a good portrait or family portrait. Um, very recently, I was reading in The Athletic about a woman who is suing Harvard, rightfully so, for the pictures of two folks who've been enslaved, and Harvard had commissioned portraits of them, and I think you all have seen them, their backs have all tons of things, I think, um, to show the atrocity of slavery and what's happening to the black body, and that, I think it is the great, 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 great granddaughter, maybe like seventh generation of that man who is suing Harvard so that she can have those pictures. And you know, I think her claim is, how long will we stop, how long would it take, what would it take for you all to stop terrorizing the black bodies and stop using them? Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, Harvard still charge for you to see that picture if you wanted to go there. Uh, and so she, she, she filed a suit to get that picture, to get those pictures. And I'm rooting for her. Um, but, I, but, one thing I see in the value of having those pictures is for anyone to, who want to claim they don't know the atrocity of slavery on the black body, that picture is a proof, that portrait is a proof. And so that's why I value portraits so much. I think it says something about the people and it puts a face to every story. It puts a face on every data or every number, every percentage that we often see in certain narratives and reports and, and news. The other thing um, I also know to be true in this world, in this country, quite frankly, in Boston, we, we don't see everyone. I don't know why, but there is something in us, maybe it's because we've been brainwashed or we, we I think white supremacy is so deep into how we are built as a society. We choose who do we see? I think we all know how the world is so sensible to the tears of a white woman. But for some reason, black women cry every day. And I think we, we are 
losing our sensibility to that. And so I think portraiture gives us a unique opportunity to always put a face to pain, put a face to triumph, to put a face to joy. And so that's why I have so much value for it. And I think I just want folks to start seeing each other. One of project of mine that is titled here is Portraits of Pride and what we did, John Hewitt is an amazing photographer and I work with him to photograph 19 LGBTQ leaders. And originally I wanted those portraits inside of a museum. And then every museum said, it, no, that's not what we do. No, it wouldn't work. We booked for six years. And somehow, again, like maybe it's a calling, it just came to me, you don't really need a museum when you have this whole city. And so I printed those portraits eight feet tall and then attached them to a 10 feet tall frame and then put them on Boston Common. You know? And a few, a few things happen with that. One, there are so many white men in the past who have killed, who have traumatized communities, and they are all on 10 feet tall frame statue, and we are honoring them. Their names are on building. And then my whole thing is that if they are really heroes who should be 10, 12 feet tall, it's these people. So let's, let's make sure they get that honor and that that respect, and I was very clear, it shouldn't just be executive directors, leaders, and the this and the that. I had activists who were graduating high school, Ashton Mota, but who's also just as amazing as the Ellie Sherry's or the Jonathan Allen's of the world. I, I wanted anyone who's 16, 17 to find inspiration, and I also wanted anyone who's 60 or 70 to find inspiration in Paul Glass, who was present at Stonewall. And so that's why I respect portraits so much. It's not just because, you know, my generation of let me take a selfie. But it's more like, you know, what can we say with images and what can we say with portraiture and what can and let's open our eyes to start seeing people for who they are. And the last one I'll make in that Atlantic article, there is a section where they talk about how before photography Artists or cartoonists would exaggerate the face of black people. They would exaggerate the body of a black woman. But when photo came around, when photography came around, we had the opportunity to show the world exactly who we look like and, and what the black body is, because I guess some people had never seen them. Um, and I, there's also a piece they talk about, um, what is the name of this man, the Afro anti anti-slavery advocate, I'm missing his name now. We all know who he is, Frederick Douglass. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's one, he's one of the most photographed men in his era, and that was his point, to make sure they see the dignity of a black man. And so I think that's the power of photo, and every time I get to take a picture of someone, I'm not a photographer though, but I also have so much respect for photographers because I think what they do is capturing the first pages of history. First of all, I just want to reiterate that his superpower is pinpointing, mm. right? Has he gotten in there? And he comes back out. So here's my question for you. How is art as a community practice? Because a lot of what you're doing is community engagement in art. How is that a part of healthier communities? I think it varies for each person. Um, in the course of the photo shoot, one thing we did is each honoree asked them, where do you want to be photographed? And I learned that from the photographer. If you bring people in the studio, they posing, they never let go. But if you photograph them on their couch, the environment gives them space to be who they are without any pretense. And, and asking them, where would you want to be photographed? People brought us where they meditate. That was special. Some folks brought us to their church. And at some point then they're praying. The, pho the photography itself, each photo shoot can take anywhere from 30 minutes, that was the governor, to seven hours. So at, by two, three hours, the subject forget we hear, and they started praying. People fell asleep during the course of the photo shoot. There's a sense of zen that happens, and, and we're just capturing that moment. John Newett, the photographer. Um, People also brought us to their home, their favorite parks. And so I think 
that's how I see it being a healthy practice because it just allowed folks to be in a space that they value and they feel like they can be themselves. And then ultimately when the portraits were on um, City Hall Plaza this year or um, Boston Common last year, I got to hear from some of the honorees saying how now, again, now their jobs are asking them, what do you think of this initiative? Oh, what do you think of this idea? It almost, it's almost as if being in the exhibit allowed the leadership of the organization to see them. Oh, Chaplet, you great. I'm just seeing you now that you're a leader because of that exhibit. Like, I, it, it's weird. I love that it has that, that impact on them and they work and giving them more power and agency to do the work that they do. But I also don't like that it took that exhibit for you to see how great they are, whereas it's because they grit in the work that they've done, they are featured in that exhibit. So a blessing and a curse, I guess, yeah. Okay. Rachel. Hello. I don't think I can add on it to anything. I think they've, totally this is good, can. we're good. The best is yet to come. <laughs> so Rachel, what is your answer? If this panel were a form of art, what form would it be? Um, I think, honestly, in, and just hearing the stories and, and the work of these incredible humans who I'm sitting next to, um, I think of the legacies that different artists have created and the work that they've done, um, of the intersection of art and music and justice and equity. Um, and I, I think a lot about, um, for example, um, I'm a pianist, I'm a fourth generation pianist. Um, I think about Nina Simone, who wanted to be a classical pianist, um, but was not able, who was not allowed to go to any conservatory that would have, have given her that education. And so she became a jazz pianist and a singer. Um, and I think of the work of Yo-Yo Ma, who is an incredible, cellist and also has used his platform in recent years um, to, to go to different landmarks and different national parks and talk about the importance of nature and, and preserving our, our wilderness and highlighting indigenous lands. Um, and I think about how lucky musicians are to be able to create this space um, that is sacred, that is so human, that and, and really allows people to um, practice self-expression and practice of autonomy and practice self-advocacy. Um, we are so lucky as musicians, as creators, um, to, to be in that kind of wonderful, weird Venn diagram of the center um, to, to advocate and to connect. Cool. Okay, Rachel, can you talk a little bit about, well, first talk a little bit about your role in sure. bridging art and then I have another question for you. Sure. Um, I uh, get to work at Community Music Center of Boston. We're located in the South End, and then we have a bunch of um, work that we do all around the community. And I think a thing that I really love about community work um, is that our goal is is not to, I, I mean, I think a, a, a thing that I hear a lot, and it comes from kind of a white savior perspective, um, is, oh, you bring music to these schools. I'm like, have you been to Roxbury? Have you been to Dorchester? <laughs> There's music there. Um, it's not like they're sitting in silence waiting for someone to say, well, this is how you play Bach. And this is how you play classical piano. Um, there is music there. We are not bringing them anything. They, mm -hmm. We get to be a part of these communities. Um, and that is a space that we are so lucky and so grateful and so humbled to be a part of. Um, I think the thing about making community music um, is, is that we, a thing that you often hear is talking about meeting people where they are. Um, and we are so lucky that we are really where people are. That is our goal. And if we are not where people are, we are not doing our jobs effectively. Um, I think it is a way of talking about music and art that, that meets the person in their goals. Um, I, I think that we need to stop looking at art and music and as these things that we achieve from a certain level of education, a certain level of discipline. Um, a lot of people do not have the privilege, the resources to go to New England Conservatory and to go to these arts academies. Um, but that does not mean they are not musicians. Mm -hmm. That does not mean they're not artists. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, I think about the incredible work of, um, you know, we have 
we're at Russell Elementary, for example, and I think about the students who had multicultural music nights, um, and to hear third graders with ukuleles singing um, songs that were, were native to um, Pacific Island cultures, um, and we got to hear second graders representing uh, Dominican and Puerto Rican and all these different cultures, and as a kid who grew up in, in Texas, and it was I'm mixed race, and then two other Asian kids. Um, it was it was so such an incredible experience to see how a community got to represent itself, and we we were so lucky to get to allow not allow them, but to support them in that process. Um, so I think it's it's really critical that any organization that is community based remembers to to think about not what we interpret maybe goals to be, but but really what we you know, to listen, to take that perspective of listening, to take that perspective of, of reaching out and, and changing who we are and taking the criticisms and taking um, the, the step of, of self-education um, because the ultimate goal is, is to allow people and, and younger generations to have this legacy of creativity and self-expression. So I, I have a follow-up question for you. Tell me how art therapy, personal health, and medical advocacy go together. Um, I'm so I'm a, I'm a music therapist, and I'm a big fan of art therapists. I'm I'm slightly biased, um, but. I, I've had a lot of, I've gotten to work in a lot of different settings as a music therapist. Um, I went to Berkeley College of Music, so I got to do my practicum all, all over the city. I did, I went at Mass General. Um, I moved back to Texas and I worked in, um, you know, Texas is just really known for their progressive values um, and their, <laughs> the way they deal with social justice. Um, but to work in all these different settings, um, I think the thing about uh, being in arts therapy, integrative therapies, um, or community arts, um, is that a lot of the times you are seeing these people much more consistently than they get to see their primary care physician. Um, you are seeing them regularly, which I think makes it really, really important that we as arts therapists, music therapists, as, as community artists, um, we take that, that role seriously. Um, we don't take it for granted. Um, we think about how we can support them, not just in that day, in those 30 minutes, 60 minutes um, of a hello song and how's it going and are we meeting our goals, but how are we meeting them and, and getting to grow with and alongside them um, over a year, over five years, over 10 years. Um, and, and so I think that that honestly, the, it, it's been a gift to be a music therapist because you do get to, to use music, which is I think a thing that is um, much easier to connect to someone rather than being like, well, let's sit on the couch and tell me about your feelings, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the thing that, you know, I think music and art is also much more culturally responsive. Um, you know, I'm Asian American. I know that for a lot of Asian Americans, talk therapy is a thing that it, it, we don't, we're not, we're not going to do that. We yeah. don't do that. Um, I know that's, that's the case for a lot of other cultures too. Um, and so being able to connect and to talk about wellness, not just in terms of mental wellness, but also physical wellness, meeting developmental goals, uh, and being able to do that in a, in a space and through a medium that, um, is centered around that person. Um, that's, that's a really incredible opportunity. Thank you. PCOS awareness um, is very important. Um, I myself have PCOS, and in the planning of this um, event, Lily, uh, Aleana, and I really wanted to center um, this conversation because September is PCOS month among Hispanic Heritage Month and among all of the other um, very important health aspects that we celebrate this month. Um, as a woman of color living with PCOS, um, I bring to this panel my own lived experience, but also acknowledging that there's other folks in the room that may have PCOS and may not know it. Uh, so we have a wonderful um, panel lined up that will bring you some education. Um, that will bring you some awareness and maybe some resources, information that you can extend to folks that may be experiencing um, some of the things we will discuss and you can say, hey, maybe you can you know, look to this as, as somewhere you can go and get checked out um, for, for what might be uh, an endocrine um, issue. 
can you guys tell us a little bit about what brought you to doing this work um, of reproductive um, medicine and you know not only using your research and your platform to advocate for women but to also take care of yourselves okay um, there we go it's working uh, so I'm uh board certified as a pediatrician and then went on to do three years of adolescent medicine, um, which is uh, this really kind of niche field that bridges endocrine issues as well as gynecologic, medical gynecological issues, as well as eating disorders and substance use and behavioral health issues, all the things that a lot of adolescents are dealing with. Um, and we take care of kids anywhere from like 11 until 25, because it's hard to graduate people sometimes too. Um, so we move into the young adult years as well. Um, and one of the reasons I came to this field is because teens are awesome and uh, it's such an exciting time of life with their emerging independence and uh, their identity development. Um, but I also really liked uh, the reproductive health issues, endocrine issues, and so it was a nice marriage of that um, with puberty and bone health and development in that way. Um, so the menstrual issues become uh, to the fore frequently for us as well as uh, gender affirming care and really supporting teens where they're at and young adults. Um, so that's why I came to this field. Um, and PCOS is, as you all maybe know already and was we'll discuss, is such a common endocrine disorder for um, individuals who have a uterus. And so um, it's a major thing that we're seeing in our clinical space. Lots that has to be learned about it still. Um, and it has uh, major health consequences for young people. So it's uh, something that um, brings me a lot of interest in my daily work. Um, and it's nice to be able to help teens and young adults kind of uh, go through that process of dealing with those health concerns. Uh, so, my interest in medicine actually really started when I did um, a needs assessment for the Breast and Cervical Cancer Initiative, which was at Dimmick Community Health Center, and we were trying to figure out how to get women mammograms, and how to get women diagnosed, mm -hmm. and how to share how important it was to get diagnosed, and how that there were treatment options, so that you did not have to be scared. That led me through into medicine and really into women's health. And in trying to think about how was I someone who could have an expertise in an in area, but really think about the whole woman and the whole body. And for me, that drew me to endocrine and in particular to reproductive endocrine. Mm. And so both in my research where we try to look at sort of the building blocks of DNA that make each of us unique individuals and understand how that impacts our risk for health and disease, really putting that in the context of thinking about women and how we can help improve their life and their fertility outcomes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for the invite. It's an honor to be here. Um, I can say that my passion for endocrinology started early on during my medical school years. I could, uh, I was closer, yes. perfect. Yes. Uh, I was saying, yeah, thanks. Um, I was saying that the passion for endocrinology started during my early medical school years while I was rotating in reproductive endocrine clinics. The majority of the patient population at the time were young girls or individuals with a uterus, and PCOS was one of the main diagnoses that drew my interest in this. And I was mainly um, fascinated by the fact that it was so complex. I was very interested in helping those patients because it's very difficult, as we're going to discuss, difficult to make the diagnosis, and also the impact that diseases like that have in someone's long-term health, including the cardiovascular health, diabetes, metabolic health. So actually, the disease diagnosis by itself was some, something that drew me into reproductive endocrinology in this field. Thank you. Thank you all. So. Can we tell, explain to the audience, well, what is PCOS um, and how do we describe it to ourselves and to um, individuals that interact with us, whether in a clinical space or in a community setting? Dr. Lippincott, if you can take us off. Okay. All right. So I describe PCOS as a polygenic disease. So when I talk about that DNA building block of makes you, you, there are changes in individuals that put them at increased risk for PCOS. What that looks like in each individual woman is different. 
So not every woman with PCOS looks the same. So the diagnostic criteria for PCOS are bins. So you have to meet two of three criteria. And each of the criteria has sub-criteria. It's this or that. And so you're often circling subsets. So I'll run through what they are quickly, if that's OK. So the, the first one, remember, you only need two of three. But the first one is irregular bleeding. That is typically menstrual cycles when you're off a birth control pill that's less than 21 or greater than 35 days. But even with that, there's a small little caveat, which is that you could be bleeding every month, but not releasing an egg every month. And there's a special hormone called progesterone that we can test at a certain time in the cycle. So that's one criteria. And really what that means is that you're not releasing an egg every month. And as a result, you have irregular bleeding. And that's often where the fertility issues with PCOS come in. The second criteria is uh, clinical, which means when someone who's a physician looks at you, or biochemical, when we test it in your blood, hyperandrogenism. And what that means is an elevation in androgens. Androgens are things like testosterone or a hormone from the adrenal, like DHEAS. These hormones are important in women. They're actually in all women. They're just modestly elevated in women with PCOS. What that often results in is women reporting, I'm struggling with acne into my 30s and 40s. I have hair growth where I don't want it, on my chest, on my stomach, on my back, in my face or chin. Or I'm losing hair where I really would like to keep it, which is typically right around the top of the head. So maybe your widow's peaks are thinning. Um, all of those are signs of clinical hyperandrogenism. So that's that hyperandrogenism diagnosis. The final one is something called polycystic ovarian morphology. We call it PCOM because who wants to say that every single time you're talking about it? People often think what it means is I have cysts in my ovaries. They're not actually cysts, they're follicles. So when you take an ultrasound, all you're saying is I see what looks like a black spot on the ovary. That black spot is actually a developing follicle that could grow and release an egg. So really what it's saying is women with PCOS have a whole bunch of little follicles that aren't developing and releasing an egg like they're supposed to. And that obviously relates back to that first criteria where you're not ovulating every month and not releasing an egg every month. That polycystic ovarian morphology criteria is extremely hard. I think all of us on the panel could tell a story about this. It depends on the ultrasound technology used. It depends on how we image it, whether we image it on top of your stomach or whether we image it transvaginally, i.e. a probe into the vagina. Um, it also depends on your age because the number of eggs you have changes as you age. So there's, there's sort of a, a numerical criteria that doesn't adjust as well for age. It's one of the reasons why, for example, Dr. Pitts, when she's diagnosing kids and adolescents, can't use it because the adolescents are young and they all have a lot of follicles um, and can have what that looks like just by chance. The Endocrine Society this year, recognizing that it's really, really hard to use this as part of the diagnostic criteria, has added the ability to check a hormone level called anti-malarian hormone, or AMH, as part of the criteria. I'm really excited that they're doing this, but right now, if you went to your doctor and said, hey, can I have this test and get the diagnosis, they'd tell you, we don't know what the number is supposed to be yet. So we actually need research, and we need research that is you know, diverse, and that includes women across all walks of life um, and all ages 
to really understand what that cutoff should be. And so I think what you might hear as a theme from all of us is every single aspect of these criteria could benefit from additional research. But those are the three criteria. And if you're like, gee, that felt more like six, you know, because of the ands or ors, you'd be right. But you just need two of those three to put you into that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lippincott. And um, you work with adolescents, so I'm going to direct this question to you. Uh, how early can PCOS symptoms present? Uh, yeah, so um, that and to just add on to what Dr. Lippincott was saying is that it's really tricky in teens because irregular periods are common. So you start having your period and that's kind of the norm in the first year for a lot of young people. Um, so the criteria are that even more nuanced in the young teen population for PCOS diagnosis. Right. Um, so, you know, going 90 days without a period in that first year would raise some red flags of why is that happening. So it's not that 21 to 35, it's like less than 21 or more than 90. And then in year two and three after having started periods, then it also it narrows a little bit more and it's more than 45. So, you know, we're always keeping these uh, thoughts in our mind about what the different criteria are. As Dr. Lippincott said, we're not getting ultrasounds anymore unless we're worried that there might be a tumor or a mass or something else, someone having a lot of uh, pain with their periods. Um, because those criteria are just too difficult to use for the PCOM criteria that were outlined in young people. Um, and for a lot of young people, they're not going 90 or more days without a period. They're bleeding every single day for three months. Um, but that can be because their um, brain uh, to ovary uh, axis is immature or it could be that they are going to have PCOS at some point. So the guidelines around adolescence is that really we shouldn't make a firm diagnosis of PCOS in some, until someone is about two years outside of having had their first period. But there are certainly people in that first two years who we can say are gonna be at risk for PCOS, whether there's a strong family history of it, or they have, um, as was mentioned, severe acne that's not uh, responding to topical treatments. They're already developing some hirsutism, which is extra hair growth in places that they might not have expected to have it, like their face, chin, you know, uh, chest, belly. Um, but hair is also normal, and we're mammals. So some hair just is what runs in the family. Um, and so trying to make those diagnoses in adolescence is tricky. The one thing I add for my young people is um, that this is a, a syndrome and not a disease. Um, and that's why it's PCOS. Um, and as was said, it's people look all different. Um, and for teens, it's a very hormonally chaotic time for many of them with many factors that are you know, impacting that, whether it's lack of sleep, stress, dietary pieces, um, the genetic parts. Um, so whether or not someone is going to have PCOS at 13 and then again also at 33 is yet to be seen. Um, but we will say your picture, we've ruled out all of these other things and your picture best is uh, represented by PCOS at this time. Or if they're within that first two years following um, the onset of periods, menarche will say you're at risk for PCOS and we're gonna keep following you over time. Um, so following teens over time to see how things kind of settle out is really, really important. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, and you know when I I when I was 18, I was exhibiting symptoms of PCOS, um, but I also take seizure medication. So you Which know, can make people look like they have it's PCOS. It's a whole soup happening. Exactly. And I was asking my doctor, you know, why am I why are my periods irregular? Why do I have them for X amount of time? And I think it goes away and it comes back. So you know, he. Ex not being an endocrine expert, he tried to explain that maybe my seizure medication was something that was impacting that and I was, you know, maturing, or it could have been something else. And when I turned 28, I got a firm diagnosis. So thank you for that education because we know that particularly women of color are more susceptible to experiencing PCOS. Um, and Lily here is you know, she's a firm advocate, not only for um, reproductive health, but also making sure that as women of color, we know what's happening in our bodies and how that um, may show up. So you said that there is more research needed. Um, and as researchers, where do you see some particular areas of opportunities, not only for the endocrine society, but also for how we bring this to our practice and 
potentially to community members. Sure, so I know Maria can speak to that as well. The one thing I will say is that most of the data that we have describing the genetic nature of PCOS that may eventually allow us to identify subgroups. Maybe you're more at risk for preeclampsia or hypertension, or a different group is more at risk for diabetes, for example, or gestational diabetes. That type of work to date, frankly, has been done in white people. Mm -hmm. And that does a disservice to everyone who is not white because we are missing information. And we are missing information that could be extremely helpful. And I do know that all of us, which is, I'm not a part of it, but is, I mean, I'm not like a, it's not something I do, but I do know that all of us, which is something that is um, uh, a large standing sort of research group, it's from the NIH, the goal is to recruit one million people of diverse backgrounds to be able to answer these types of questions. And so I think the one thing that I could say is it's actually a very transparent um, research organization. They've actually been very deliberate in how they've constructed it. And so if anyone is ever interested, please look it up yeah. and read about it and see if it's something that might call to you to help us gain that information. Because I think that's one piece that's gonna be really important for us. Um, the other thing I'll say is if you feel like you have PCOS and you feel like you're not being listened to, it is one of the most common things that women with PCOS report. It is out there in the literature, the number of doctors they have to see before they get a diagnosis, the number of times someone is told, oh, you have that because of X, Y, or Z, the number of times someone says, I have things that I feel like don't maybe all fit together um, that can include sleep apnea, depression, anxiety, hypertension, high cholesterol can all be related to PCOS if you have the PCOS symptoms. So I would say don't give up. Yeah. It's okay to advocate for yourself and it's okay to call and see someone um, because the earlier you can get diagnosed, I think the more empowering it is for someone to know what's going on in their body and being able to take charge of their health. So yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lippincott. Thank you. I, I agree uh, with Dr. Lippincott about the difficulty of making the diagnosis, and I've seen the struggle of patients seeing multiple different providers before the final diagnosis is made. So there was a recent study showing that at least one third of patients with PCOS spent more than two years seeing different doctors before a film diagnosis is made, and seeing more than three providers, and still not figuring out what's going on with their bodies. In addition to what um, has been said already in terms of symptoms. We talked about the irregular periods, the acne, the polycystic morphology and ultrasound. I have had a lot of my patients come in into clinic with other symptoms, as Meg mentioned. For example, complaining of difficulty losing weight. And um, I, I occasionally get some irregular periods, but I'm not sure what's happening in my body. So eventually, those symptoms initiated the process of evaluation and the diagnosis of PCOS was made and, and we were able to act uh, to help our patients. Uh, in terms of your questions, going back to your questions about the research and yeah. the genetic research that is being done, um, our, our research has mainly focused on the different genes that, that control PCOS, and I know that Dr. Lippigott has um, a lot to say about that too, uh, but it seems that what we see in our patients clinically, meaning that everyone presents differently, in a very diverse presentation, we also see it in their genetic factors. For example, there are genes that predispose someone to have obesity with PCOS and that develop diabetes. There are other group of genes that make someone being insulin resistant without being obese or without carrying extra weight, leading also to PCOS. Other genes that contribute to the irregularity of the periods in, in women with PCOS. And also, finally, genes that they cause some whole body inflammation, that is a, it, it is a feature of the um, polycystic ovary syndrome. There's definitely a lot of room for research in this. 
I, uh, I echo Dr. Lipico's um, statement, making that we do need to expand the research in women from all different ethnic backgrounds, uh, including um, black and Hispanic backgrounds. That is very, very important um, to be included in the research, and we should definitely advocate for that. And I have a follow-up question for you. Thank you. That's so wonderfully um, said by all of you. Does PCOS only impact women? Well, that's a great, great question. Um, I will start. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, feel free to, um, to um, comment on that too. Uh, very recently, uh, a group, um, actually in Boston Children's Hospital, mm -hmm. Investigated the role of the genes that cause PCOS in women. What is the role of those genetic changes in men? Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a link between the, the same genetic variation and the cardiovascular health or obesity or metabolic health in men. Mm -hmm. So there is an emerging role for um, gen PCOS risk score for men for sure, and that there is room for further evaluation. I don't know if anyone. Yeah. So I'll speak a little bit because we have a whole reproductive ethics field <laughs> and I'm fascinated with it. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Dr. King's research, but she is, she's not an endocrinologist, but she is an OBGYN. So when I was in the program, her and I will have this conversation, and I actually read that paper um, that if, you, if your mother has PCOS, and as a male, you are predisposed to also having PCOS, and it may present differently. It may present as balding or, you know, rece receding of hair, um, among other things like, like women, um, excess growth or diabetes or all of these symptoms that are really a cluster of symptoms, but because you're a man and this is a disease that has been historically associated with women, um, you don't really think about that. That's why I asked that question. Um, so thank you for the education. Please not. Yeah, I was just going to add, because recently, the, so there's an androgen excess society um, that thinks a lot about this uh, diagnosis. And they actually had just um, put a call out for changing the name of PCOS. And I think it's around some of these issues. It's one that there's not actually cysts. So it's a terribly named diagnosis, right, um, to begin with. But also the fact that it affects everyone um, potentially um, in different ways um, based on what we're learning from genetics. And the other piece I'll say to this, and I know that um, uh, I totally know what you were referring to, um, when I'm seeing, I have many gender diverse patients, and I think one of the challenges with PCOS, because it is always framed as a diagnosis for women, um, is that people come in and the assumption is that they don't want the hair, uh, and you know they wanna have regular periods, and a lot of my um, transgender or gender diverse patients are really happy with the hair they have. Mm -hmm. um, they get less happy with the alopecia, but they're very happy with the facial hair. But that, you know, again, I, what I try to come with a curious approach um, yeah. and make, yeah. you know, a kind of a menu approach. And I'm sure we'll get to talking about treatment in a minute. But like, what are you concerned about with this constellation of symptoms? What bothers you? Um, and it's amazing, some people want regular periods, some people don't want any periods. Some people want periods every three months, some, you know. So I think that's the other piece, is kind of coming at it um, uh, with an individualized approach for everyone. Um, yeah. Because everybody is very different in that regard about how they want to approach their syndrome that they have. And you know, you, you, I want you to take us into this constellation of treatment um, because you brought it up. Um, one of the things that I see is that too, when we're having conversations, do we want to have our periods? Do we want the excess hair growth? You know, these are all conversations that we have intimately. So please take us into what that conversation of treatment looks like. Yes, yeah, so I can tell you from the teen kind of young adult standpoint, and then you guys can take it from the adult standpoint when fertility comes much in form to the fore. Um, I think that, uh, as I said, I try to say that you have a menu of options for PCOS, um, and it really depends. Because it is such a heterogeneous picture, people all look different with this. Some people are struggling with their weight, some people aren't. Some people have acne that really bothers them, some people have acne and it doesn't bother them. So I really, as I said, try to be curious around what are you interested in treating? Here are the pieces that we've identified that may have some health impacts to you, whether it's diabetes or if I'm noting um, acanthosis, which is the, dark, the extra darkness around people's skin on their neck, armpits, in their groin. Um, that's a sign of insulin resistance. Whether or not 
are having other metabolic features such as high blood pressure or high cholesterol that we would want to treat. Um, so the mainstay for everyone, and this goes for all teens and young adults, is healthy lifestyle approach. So eating in a balanced way, getting in your food groups, making sure that you're fitting in exercise, getting adequate sleep, risk redu uh, reducing stress. I tell my teens, if you can figure out how to all do all this, write a book because you'll be a gajillionaire because it's really hard to be a teenager um, and be navigating all of these pieces. But certainly, the out external stressors and the things that we do to our bodies each day impact us hormonally. Um, and so I think it's really important for teens to start there by trying to think about what they're eating, how they're exercising, et cetera. And that just goes for everyone, whether you have PCOS or not. But certainly people with PCOS um, will do much better if they can uh, start thinking about some of those things. And with the insulin resistance that many, but not all of them obviously have, um, without doing further testing, um, they'll respond to reducing the high carbohydrate in intake, reducing simple sugars, having more complex carbohydrates. Um, so we often will have them meet with one of our dietitians um, who really can think globally with them because it's not about weight loss necessarily. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer of health at every size. It's really about healthy lifestyle approaches um, and you can you know, have a BMI of 20 and be unhealthy, and you can have a BMI of 35 and be healthy because you're eating well and moving your body in a healthy way. So again, we try to listen to what people are doing. And then um, we're managing the periods, um, making sure that they're not having periods too often or bleeding like for 30 days and becoming anemic, yeah. um, but also not going too long without having a period because that'll put them at risk for having what we call endometrial hyperplasia, um, which can put them at risk for abnormal cells, um, endometrial cancer down the line. I, they think more about that. Um, it's not as common in teens, but it does put them at risk for that. Um, we're always thinking about contraception if people need that as well. And so the dual purpose of yeah. whether or not someone has contraceptive needs um, if they are bothered by the acne in the hair, then we can certainly do a lot uh, topically for their uh, acne. There are anti-androgen medications that we prescribe a great deal, like spironolactone, if people are bothered by the hirsutism that they're having or, and or by the acne. Um, and then lastly is the metabolic part, and we do prescribe a lot of metformin um, for people who are showing signs of insulin resistance or if they have outright type 2 diabetes, but that's again rarer in the teens. Um, but certainly that's something that we use a lot. I think on the horizon um, from a research and better understanding standpoint are some of these GLP-1 agonists like the Wagovis and the Ozempics that are out there that everyone's heard so much about um, and whether or not that'll play a big role in um, uh, PCOS, um, especially for young people. I worry about all these medications and what it's going to do to young developing bodies because there's it's a very active uh, time frame, um, bone health, brain health, and how these medications are impacting young people. We need more research on that. Yeah. Um, we don't know. We don't know how some of the um, probiotics or inositol, um, some of those other agents which are you know over the counter um, but are expensive might impact teens in this way too. So I think a lot of it has to be learned about that. But that's, that's the starter and I'll let you guys take it off for adults. So I might... Um sort of start by talking about fertility um, and maybe hand off some of the metabolic stuff to Maria because I yeah. think fertility is a big issue for women with PCOS. Um, I think we know particularly for black women with PCOS, according to sort of a meta-analysis of at least 11 studies, it's associated with a lower quality of life. And so that's really important to acknowledge. I think it's also important to acknowledge that women with PCOS are at increased risk for pregnancy outcomes that are negative. So that includes things like gestational diabetes that Maria mentioned earlier. That includes things like preeclampsia, which we already know can be as more commonly seen in the black population. Um, um, and so I think it's important to recognize that when we're talking about fertility, there are two different aspects to it. One is the ability to get pregnant, and the second is making sure someone has good maternal care with someone who knows that women with PCOS are at risk so that they can monitor them appropriately. Um, the first issue in terms of fertility is that recent data coming out, just came out from the Endocrine Society this past year, is that there is not 
of fertility shortfall across the entire life of a woman with PCOS. But there is one particularly in the young 20s. Mm -hmm. So it does appear as if when women with PCOS age, for some of them, not all of them, periods can get a little bit more regular. And we had, uh, I think I had mentioned earlier, regular periods are really a proxy for ovulating and releasing an egg every month. And that's really how you're able to get pregnant, is releasing that egg and having that egg be able to meet sperm. Um, and so there are very effective medications for PCOS for fertility. However, the way health insurance has been constructed, um, public plans for health insurance cover the diagnosis of but not the treatment for infertility. And so this is a huge shortfall for anyone who is economically disadvantaged, and this includes individuals who have been historically discriminated against and as a result are economically disadvantaged. Yeah. Um, and that really does affect the black community. And so some of this shortfall is an equity issue. Yeah. It's an equity access issue. We have the medications and we have the drugs. It's expensive because you have to be monitored. You need ultrasound monitoring. You need expensive medications. Um, and that's where it becomes more complicated. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think in terms of the fertility, we actually do know really well how to treat women with PCOS. We have really great options. I wish we had great options that could easily be given to everyone. And that's why, honestly, I was thrilled when you guys reached out to me because I thought I want to make a plea on the equity side yeah. that this is something that really needs advocacy. Yeah. In terms of pregnancy outcomes and negative pregnancy outcomes, they occur across the weight spectrum for women with PCOS. So although, yes, it's important to maintain everything you can do to maintain your health, these are intrinsic risks that need to be monitored. Um, and so making sure that you're partnered or have a team that knows to treat someone with PCOS as if they're at higher risk is really important. Um, so that's what I'd say about fertility. The rest of our management is very similar to what Dr. Pitts was discussing. How can we make sure you have a regular menstrual cycle? How can we treat the things that are bothering you about PCOS? The thing for me that I'm passionate about is women across their lifespan. So when women enter menopause, PCOS doesn't go away. Mm. Those risk factors are still there. Um, they do probably confer an increased risk for heart disease, which is really important for women to know. That's sometimes when women start noticing more of the female pattern hair loss that is associated with PCOS. So there are ways that we can both treat and screen women to make sure that we are addressing that. And then on the metabolic side, I'm sure. I'm going to uh, briefly add on the metabolic side, we know that according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 50% of patients with PCOS will develop type 2 diabetes by the age of 40. And that has an impact on during a pregnancy. So women with PCOS are at a higher risk for developing gestational diabetes or diabetes of pregnancy, which can affect their health, the embryo's health, the baby's health. Um, we also know that black patients tend to suffer more frequently from obesity, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, which metabolic syndrome means higher blood pressure, higher cholesterol, and higher BMI, and overall that increases the cardiovascular uh, health risk. So it is important whenever um, we assess our patients to think about their ethnic uh, background, it is important to think about the risk for the uh, metabolic complications of PCOS, and um, we have medications that we can help with. Um, um, as Dr. Pitts mentioned metformin, also the GLP receptor agonist, the weekly injections. We don't have good data about what happens long term, I agree, uh, but these are new tools. And equally to the fertility medications, we do come across 
a lot of issues with health insurance and coverage when it comes to those medications. Um, so that's definitely something we should uh, advocate for, especially for people who have been discriminated against. I want to follow up on this insurance question because it seems like um, insurance is a con I felt your I felt your deep breath on that one, um, and it's something that as clinicians you guys have to, in order to get paid, that's part of the billing the billing procedure. So I want to dive a little bit into this debate of how insurance can often be a barrier for um, not only women of color but people, period, accessing resources that would really be beneficial to their health. Um, so whoever wants to start us off, please. I, I, can start, and I, can, I can definitely say that. And this is a safe space. Really? <laughs> Are there any insurance providers? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I'll be honest and say that health insurance very usually is a barrier, and health insurance coverage is a barrier to um, the medications that we're going to choose to treat our patients with. And that we come across that, especially when it comes to fertility treatment, we do see it a lot. Um, I mean, we do take care of patients with reproductive disorders, both males and males, where we need to prescribe medications for fertility. Um, and personally, I mean, my colleagues can also comment on that. We do come across a lot of difficulties with insurance coverage. We do have teams that we work with trying to appeal a denial for insurance, so we do try our best in terms of appealing denials or getting the best coverage for our patients. Uh, but I can tell you that it is, it is a, it's an everyday struggle. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anyone has anything. I guess the one thing I'll add is that referral for nutrition counseling is another place where there are gaps in who is covered and who isn't covered. And I would say one of the things that um, I find frustrating, but I know my patients find more frustrating, is that I can't always predict who's going to be covered or not. Mm -hmm. There are literally at this point hundreds of different subtypes Products. of insurance yeah. options. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's very, very hard to figure out. And I'll tell you one of the things that I have done is worked very hard to actually incorporate nutrition counseling into my visits with patients because I know that they've been able to come see me and so I try to take a very holistic common sense approach about small things people can do that are cost effective that build into what their current diet is like um, so that just tiny choices um, that can actually make a big difference in terms of overall health. Um, and so I try to try to make up for the fact that I know mm -hmm. that there's that limitation right. by incorporating that, I would say. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I won't go off too much on insurers, but um, there's, you I mean, <laughs> but it's a major health equity issue too, right? Yeah. I mean, um, Mass Health is pretty good compared to other medi state yeah. Medicaid um, insurers, but you know, I, I can prescribe something for someone who has private insurance, and someone who has Mass Health, I can't prescribe that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as Dr. Lippincott said, there are so many different insurance products, uh, and we're at a point where people don't really trust clinicians anymore to make the best judgment of what's going to be good for the patient. Insurers, I know it, it's a bottom line issue for them, like they're a business and they have to make sure that they are um, thinking in that way and they're not thinking about the individual. So if I want to prescribe a certain medication for someone because I think that's going to be the best one for them and then their insurance says no, in my mind that doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. Um, but this is the world we live in. Um, metformin, for example, which is a medication which is well known to be used in PCOS. There's extended release versions that you can only have to take with dinner once a day, and then there's the shorter acting that you have to take twice a day. It's already hard for these kids who are taking maybe a, a hormonal agent to manage the periods, spironolactone to manage their hirsutism, topical acne meds, and metformin to have to do that twice a day. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard for adults to do it. It's really hard for teens to do it, right? Because they're busy, they have so much going on, and now they're taking four meds and they have to do it twice a day. 
So they are not going to be optimized if they can't get the extended release version. And there are insurers who say, yeah, we don't cover that. Why? It's yeah. been out forever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's not right, and it creates major gaps, and it uh, means it's hard for young people and old people alike, I'm sure, to get the treatment that's actually best for them so that they can be as healthy as they can be. And that's, it's a real problem. Yeah, I, I would agree it's a problem. Now, you don't want to get me started on the insurance <laughs> conversation because I have this conversation um, in the space of mental health. Oh, um, boy. Let's and, go there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can be here all day. So I do agree that, and we just had a recent, like, healthcare overhaul where all of these insurances switched and people got bumped off of certain plans and switched to another one that may not cover the treatment that you guys know the mess. So when things like this happen and we know that systemic inequality is alive and well, um, how do we interface with our patients to and encourage them? to take more holistic approaches, understanding that the system is not there to meet them where they're at. We want to meet them where they're at, but systems are systems, and we have to wait for them to do what they need to do to get the memo. So Dr. Lippincott, you started us off on, you gave us a nudge, but can you give us a little bit more of what are the types of things that you see in clinic, and what are the certain steps that you take to encourage someone to be a little healthier on their own before you can get them where you want them to get them clinically? Uh, sure, so I think Healthy movement for the body is something that is good for everyone, but healthy movement does not mean I have to go to a gym, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean I have to buy a fancy pair of running shoes, right? It could mean I'm dancing to YouTube in my living room for 20 minutes every day after dinner. It's, 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 um, it's trying to figure out what brings either joy or peace into someone's life that involves movement and trying to encourage them. That's where I take it because unless I think you get something out of that movement personally for you, it's very hard sort of abstractly to say, I'm doing this for my health, I'm doing this for my health, I'm doing this for my health, but I'm yeah. really bored yeah. and I really yeah. don't like what I'm doing. And not like, be there. <laughs> like I just, like I have, I. I struggle with that, and so I, I, I think my heart goes out to try to find out what could be movement that someone could incorporate. Okay. The other one involves um, food. You know, um, we have areas in Massachusetts that are food deserts. It's hard to get fresh fruits and vegetables. Sometimes it's hard to have access to something like an oven, so you can do a large bake or a large cook or have enough freezer space to store things from a bulk cook that you could do to make your life easier. So every single day you're not trying to cook fresh fruits and vegetables on top of working, on top of taking care of kids, mm -hmm. on top of taking mm -hmm. care of your parents, on top of every, everything else that we pile on right. um, that uh, can be an issue. And so I really start from a standpoint of curiosity, which is how do you currently do it? Yeah. Is it working for you? What are things that you might be able to bring in? So I try to search for, are there farmer's markets that are reasonable? Is there an area that's easy to get fruits and vegetables? I might pull up a list of fruits and vegetables and say, have you ever tried some of these? Yeah. Because some people are like, I don't really like the vegetables and I was like okay well which which well, which are they <laughs> you know because there are a lot and often it's an issue of maybe you didn't grow up with your parents cooking that vegetable but that's actually a vegetable that you like and so very very practical so one of the tips that I often encourage people um, is I often encourage them to swap pasta pasta for a lentil or a chickpea pasta mm -hmm. because it's higher protein, it's more complex carbohydrates, it's very filling, it's not the simple sugar carbohydrates. Um, and so I often, I have like tips for how do you cook it? Mm -hmm. You know, if you like pasta that's crispier, I suggest one thing. Mm -hmm. If you like it that's a little mushier, I suggest another way. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
I, you know, it sounds like, why am I doing that? I'm doing that because I want to give people super easy, practical things that they can do with diet and lifestyle modification that make their life easier, but at the same time improve the quality of what's happening. Those and would be my examples. And I'll add on to that because, you know, we, uh, I'm Dominican and we eat, well, my mom doesn't cook that healthy. I will be very transparent, but her food is so delicious. But I'm on this journey of um, becoming gluten-free um, and dairy-free because I understand that that is not good for my reproductive health. And as I'm getting older, my PCOS may be getting, you know, she's coming along the journey with me. So I need to make these dietary changes in order to be able to take care of my body. And that may mean eliminating that fried empanada that I want to eat every single day, but I can't. And if I want to eat it, what is the way that I can consume it that will be healthier? So today we actually had Dominican food. And one of the things that I spoke to before I catered was, is the majority of this food gluten-free? Um, how do you fry your food? With what oils do you use? You know, it, they may have been looking at me like, oh my God, she's asking too many questions, but I'm also thinking about we are in a cultural space that people will enjoy this food, but I want them to consume food on a healthy measure. And they, you know, we had yuca patties, which are super good. Mm -hmm. um, they actually fry them in like olive oil, which is great. Perfect. So we don't have to really abandon the foods that we're eating, just thinking about how do we consume this in a healthier way instead of putting all of that pasta sauce how about you make some you know it's really fun to make pasta sauce so you know what you're putting into your body instead of putting those 20,000 ingredients on the back you grab three or four ingredients in your kitchen and that is a healthy way also that unconsciously you're taking care of your body and what could be uh, decreasing symptoms that could develop in, in later age and then we'll close out with um, you with some recommendations, and then doc sure. Dr. Samu and Dr. Lopez here. Sure. Uh, yeah, if I were to add uh, something to that, is that we do know that uh, people with PCOS have cravings for carbs. So that's a truth. It's not that our patients are imagining that they want to eat pasta every day and, and of smoking with nutrition sugar, yes. <laughs> and of smoking with nutrition is um, confirming that. So cutting down carbs is so much easier said than done. Um, or, you know, when we try to say, cut down, don't eat pasta every day, but maybe substitute a meal to something else. So instead of um, like the regular pasta, maybe whole wheat pasta, mm -hmm. or some quinoa for some days, uh, or cutting down the portion of the pasta with half um, the dish being or plate being some pasta or carbs and half of it being some vegetables or our fruit, maybe maybe some that like small steps that we can take at a time. Because like changing completely someone's diet from one day to the other, it is impossible. And if it happens, it's only gonna last for a week. Right. So I, I usually do recommend small changes, like one at a time, and then having close follow-up with my patients to make sure they get their support and the encouragement in, in that journey. Yes, thank you. Because we like to eat a lot of bread. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, yeah. yeah. Um, for my teen patients, a few additional recommendations I make is be careful of social media um, because it's, there's a lot of false information out there and my teens are on a lot of social media and mm -hmm. they're getting all of their medical advice from uh, TikTok and Instagram and uh, it's very worrisome. So making sure they're engaging in, with healthcare providers who are keeping their finger on the pulse of the research out there. Um, Self-love, too. You had mentioned mental health. There's higher rates of depression and anxiety in young people and women who have uh, PCOS, so I think it's supporting that part. Um, there's a lot of weight stigma, and so also recognizing that, and that's only going to create more toxic stress, which is only going to worsen your PCOS, so it's really addressing the mental health side of things. Um, and making sure people aren't engaging in eating disordered behaviors, um, because a lot of times people are so worried about their weight, they're told you have to lose weight because that's what's causing your PCOS. So then they go on these big restriction, um, back and forth behaviors, um, cutting way too much out of their diet and then overeating. Um, 
and that's just as unhealthy. So trying to find a moderate sweet spot where you can still have an empanada once in a while. Um, and there's a spot for that, but there's also spots for adding in um, some other things and still feeling good about yourself um, in the end of the day, because I think toxic stress is just gonna do worse for your heart than any empanada is gonna do, so um, yeah. in my mind, but. And stress causes cancer, <laughs> so we have to keep that in mind, too. So. One of the things that I really wanted to do was um, uplift people in the community that are doing the work. And as someone that is always in community events, um, I always see the same people getting the accolades and the recognition, and there are some really silent, masters out there doing what it takes to advance health equity. So, um, yeah, this is our first inaugural award ceremony, um, which we hope to have many more in the future. I'm going to ask uh, Katie to bring me the awards. Uh, they're right behind me. Oh, you're already ahead of the game. Um, so, I want to start by acknowledging um, one of my beautiful uh, sisters and sisters. Um, and I was a little biased, you know, but I hope you guys can forgive me. Um, Lily Marcelin with um, <laughs> um, Lily has been a fierce advocate in a reproductive um, health. encouraging me to stay the course and it's a deep honor for me to um, give you this award on behalf of um, Helen Rodriguez Trias who is a pediatrician and a, and a public health, health ethicist at, at the margins. margins also advocating for women's reproductive rights and dignity and public health practices for minoritized communities so thank you Lily for all that you do <laughs> You can stay up here. Another one of my favorites. I have been hearing buzzes about this organization, and it just so happened that I went to their, um, I went to an event they had, which is uh, their annual event, and I was like, oh, this organization is the bomb.com. Um, Raw Arts in Lynn, Rosario Uviera Minaya. I felt like when I met you, we were sisters and I knew you for a long time. Um, we are giving Rosario the Cultural Keeper Award. Rosario is the executive director of Raw Arts, but she's also a mover and shaker in Boston. Um, she works with kids using arts therapy as a medium for healing. Um, she is an educator. She is an, a pollinator, and she is a woman to know, okay? So, Rosario, thank you for all that you do, not only for the kids, but for us as creatives and representing us and making sure that culture is at the forefront of everything that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are gonna make me cry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and of course, we, we'll all take a picture together. And of course, this is someone whose work I've been following for a little while. You know, we always see um, people in the public sphere talking the talk, but this is a woman who talks the talk and walks the walk. She is from here, our Rock's very own Senator Liz Miranda. <laughs> Senator Liz, thank you. You know better than I do um, the work that you do for our communities. You know that you're out there not only bringing the message from the people into your policies, but making sure that people know why it's important. I've read your bills. Um, I read them every day to remind me why I do this work, because it's not easy work. 
Um, and we have seen the work that you're doing and we admire it. That bill that you just co-signed on health equity is going to change communities. <laughs> So lucky to have you. So thank you. Thank you. These are the women that I look up to. So let's give them another round of applause. Um, and thank them for being here. So we're going to wrap this up. Um, I had just a, a quick little few closing remarks, and I took some notes, and then I'm going to ask Lily to, to take the mic. Um, I just think the beauty of this health equity symposium is the overwhelming communication, the love in this room. You brought us here, Joanne. I mean, you, I didn't know that when I met you a couple months ago that I was going to gain a sister. And this makeup has been on since really early in the morning, so I'm not going to scare you all when it starts running. Um, but the communication through through listening, through art, through relationship, through food and community, culture, speaking, vulnerability, experiences. You all are so brave to be here and to take time and to talk about things that are uncomfortable, health issues, racial equity, issues, equity, just culture, all of it. Um, you are helping people to, to be seen as they are, where they are in that moment, and there is nothing more beautiful than community and the information that we just got and the, just the wealth of resources we didn't just focus on the inequities and the lack thereof. We focused on the strengths in our own community. And that is so This makeup's been on since really early in the morning, so I'm not going to scare y'all when it starts raining. Um, but the communication through, through listening, through art, through relationship, through food and community, culture, speaking, vulnerability, experiences, you all are so brave to be here and to take time and to talk about things that are uncomfortable, health issues, racial equity, issues, equity, just culture, all of it. Um, you are helping people to, to be seen as they are, where they are in that moment, and there is nothing more beautiful than community and the information that we just got and the, just the wealth of resources. We didn't just focus on the inequities and the lack of, we focused on the strengths in our own community, and that is so, so incredible. All of the people here love you and are grateful for you, and so Lily, we have another award, right? Because there is someone we have to thank. Absolutely. Yes. 
Joy, you are just amazing. Um, I just not know how to thank you enough for just everything that you do. You're gonna make me cry, and when I start crying, it's really hard for me to stop. <laughs> but I, I feel like it was so important for us to also acknowledge you for um, just for everything that you have done and that you are doing and will continue to do. I, I just want. For a I just want people to, I'd like to have someone read out loud that's the tagline to post there for a second for me. Could I have your volunteer? Yes. Envisioning a world of health, prosperity for Latino, Black, and Indigenous communities. It says, not wealth. Not that we, we wouldn't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> but health, she said. You can have wealth, but if you do not have health, do you really have wealth? Amen. Amen. So long. You can, you know, it's, it would be great to have wealth and health. But if you cannot have one, we'll go with the health, right? So this is, this is what she um, chooses to be a part of Prospera. So there are many words you could have chosen, but you really chose that. And where is justice? Justice is in prevention. Justice is bringing equity. And prevention, in the way to achieve this health prosperity is by bringing justice. It's by really, integ um, by, it's really integration of bioethics in everything. Yes. If we are, if, if indeed we manage to do that, to make sure that bioethics is part of health disparities. Bioethics is part of medicine. Bioethics and food justice, environmental justice, women's reproductive health rights, immigrant rights. We would have a much better world. And you are trying to achieve that. She told me what she wanted to do, and I was like, oh my gosh. You know, so many people, when you, so bio, when you say bioethics, they start thinking of like Ivy Towers. Yeah. Or it's like, oh, what does that mean? How does that apply to real world? Well, you know how to apply it to real world. You know how to bring it into our communities where we really, really need that. So we want to really thank you. We want to uplift you. We want to, we want to wish you success. We want to wish you grace, empathy, tender, tenderness, all the wonderful, loving attributes that you deserve to carry, to carry you through this work, to be on this journey. Do know that we are with you, behind you, beside you, around you on this journey. You are not by yourself. Thank you so much. So, so. Thank you.